Um, we have a great uh, uh, two panels uh, lined up uh, here. Um, I am just going to uh, hand over to our CEO president, uh, George Nashak, who drives the uh, organization uh, here. So with that, let me hand over to George. Thank you, Shadrin. Good morning, everyone. We are very excited to welcome you to the first in-person seminar we've done since 2019, which is very exciting. We did keep it going virtually, but it's nice to see all of you in three dimensions. A key part of the mission of Care for the Homeless is to prompt conversations like this. We are service providers, as you know. We provide health care, we provide residential and social services, but a key part of our mission is to make certain that we are supporting dialogue about solutions to homelessness, particularly in New York City. Um, and today we bring together several stakeholders to discuss opportunities not only to respond to the immediate crisis, but also, more importantly, to contribute to long-term solutions. We've convened this morning a panel of distinguished speakers. Um, we include on all of our events, uh, as I think you know, people with lived experience because it is critically important for us to li listen to people with lived experience. We often get the best ideas from people with lived experience. Um, and we want to really discuss this morning um, what the landscape of homeless health care looks like in New York City and how do we expand the capacity of healthcare systems, and I think that that's going to be one of the themes we addressed this morning, the fact that there isn't a system, but there are many systems that address or try to address the needs of people experiencing homelessness, um, and try to come up with some solutions that we might be able to take away and incorporate into our practice. Most of the people in this room are practitioners of one sort or another, and so we want to really give folks a set of tools to bring back and change the way we practice and improve the care to the people that we serve. Um, I want to Take a second to um, thank MasterCard. MasterCard has generously underwritten and sponsored this event. Um, we've got a wonderful board member, Jonna Kadambi, who has arranged the sponsorship through MasterCard. And I want to thank Jonna for doing that um, this morning. I also, just a little bit of logistics here, I want to mention two opportunities that you're going to have to submit questions for the Q&A. The panelists will have presentations, of course, and we'll have dialogue with the moderators, but we want some audience participation as well. Um, you can submit questions via Twitter by tagging at CFHNYC, at CFHNYC. Alternatively, um, index cards were distributed at the registration desk, and you can, if you prefer, uh, write your question on the index card, and we'll uh, submit it to one of our staff members, and we'll get that in front of the panelists. We'll have somebody picking those up during the discussion. I'd now like to take a moment and invite our keynote speaker uh, to the uh, panel here, um, Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Mental Hygiene at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Deepa Avala. Um, Deputy Commissioner Avala has over 20 years of specialized experience at the state and national level in leadership positions in strategic planning, policy development, program implementation, and operations in the behavioral health care field. Um, it's an honor to have her join us in this kickoff discussion. You know, the intersection between homelessness and mental health is something that's addressed almost daily in the, in, the, in the media, and so we think it's particularly relevant to have someone with such a deep bench of mental health experience joining us this morning at our panel. And so I'd like to introduce Deepa Avila. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for, for having me here today. One of the things that I thought um, I would do is share a little bit about the city's mental health plan because as was just explained, there is really a very key intersection uh, between, between mental health issues, behavioral health in general, and, and homelessness. And honestly, some of that is actually it's quite sad. It's, it, it, it really does reflect um, a lack of attention over many, many, many years and decades in, in our healthcare system to address certain mental health and behavioral health issues. Um, and I think that what we're doing now as a city is we're really trying to figure out how to bring all resources to bear to try to address, again, what, what has been a historical lack of attention, resources, focus on 
addressing mental health as a true health condition. Um, so the city has developed a mental health plan that focuses on three primary populations. One is the needs of individuals with serious mental illness. The second is youth and families. And then the third is really addressing um, substance use disorder among our uh, communities. Um, on, on the first priority population, which is serious mental illness, we have essentially four pillars that we are looking to address address, health, home, community, and response. When we talk about health, we, really what we're talking about there is very self-explanatory. Getting affordable, easily accessible health care to individuals with serious mental illness. We know that individuals with serious mental illness make up a disproportionate uh, share of individuals who have premature mortality. We know that an individual with serious mental illness is more is more likely to have uh, again premature mortality at a rate of two to three and a half times that of the general population. Um, we also know that there's life loss at, at almost a, a decade of life expectancy for individuals with SMI. So providing necessary care and treatment via uh, a sort of community treatment teams, via mobile crisis teams, really addressing the needs of individuals with SMI is, is a real pillar. One of the other things, and particularly relevant to today's conversation, is the concept of home. We also know that individuals who are not stably housed are also more likely to experience physical health conditions, mental health conditions, other issues that affect their daily well-being. So what we have done is we've really tried to focus on addressing the needs of serious mental of individuals with serious mental illness who are also unhoused. So that it, that reflects about 13,000 people right now in the city. And so what we've done is we've really refocused our efforts on expanding supportive housing. We know that supportive housing models work. So when an individual has stable and supportive housing, they're more likely to get other needs met. We also know that it's really going to take an all hands on deck system and we're really trying to make the system administratively easier to access, right? So we also understand that it's really complicated to get into supportive housing. It's very complicated for providers to do referrals. It's very complicated to then get sort of a, a network of support that's actually needed to serve individuals who are homeless who may also have um, significant health conditions. So we're working right now to implement as across the city really looking at a, a, a digital hub, a digital access point. So a, a single point of access to our healthcare system which will then allow us to easily connect across different um, sectors like housing and other others um avenues that, that require such support. So we're working on that right now. We're again, as I mentioned, we have currently 11,200 supportive housing units. We're looking to expand that by at least 1,000 by 2025. And we have a much more ambitious plan to expand to even greater numbers uh, with, with our partners at HRA. Um, and again, so when, when we talk about housing, we really talk about it as an integral part of making sure that a person's health is addressed. So, and we want to do this in a way that's sort of a collective way, right? Not just talking about housing in one silo and health in another, another silo and employment in another silo. We're really trying to bring these together because, again, you know, in our own daily lives, all of these things interact. So it, it is, it's silly to build a system, right, where, where, the, where the systems don't interact. So we're really trying to, to work on building that closer together. One of the other aspects of addressing SMI in the city is really looking at community. And when I say community, what I mean is we're trying to ensure that individuals with serious mental illness have a life in the community, just like everyone else does, just like everyone else wants. We want to make sure that individuals with SMI are not sort of destined for a life of isolation or loneliness. Um, and, and not simply that their housing needs are met, but also that they have a place to go in the community, that they have people to rely on, that they have people who rely on them. And the clubhouse model is a very um, evidence-based, effective way of doing this. And so we're really trying to uh, enhance clubhouse models across the city. And again, clubhouse models really focus on psychosocial rehabilitative services, including employment training, including linkages to housing. So one of the things we want to do is we want to make sure to address both the homeless population and the population with serious mental illness is that, we, again, we're not just addressing housing needs, but we're also then linking to other supports and services in the community. So we're very focused on, on expanding clubhouse models, and we, you should be hearing more about that from us over, over the next several months. 
In addition to that, we are building and really expanding upon our crisis response system. One of the things we know is right now when an individual is in mental health crisis, they're most likely to call 911. We don't want individuals in a mental health crisis to call 911. We want them to call 988, which is the three digit uh, phone number that assists individuals who are experiencing acute mental health crisis, where they are connected to a trained uh, licensed crisis counselor, and if they need assistance physically, if they need help on site, we send mobile crisis teams. Again, we're trying to ensure that we have health-led responses wherever possible, that individuals who have serious mental illness, individuals who may be um, unstably housed, are ending up in, in places that know how to serve them, that know how to meet their needs. So you'll hear us talk a lot about, again, bringing different systems together, ensuring that we are meeting the needs of of all populations and ensuring that we're doing that in a way that is collective. One of the things that, and, and as was mentioned, I have a, a significant amount of federal experience as well as state experience. And one of the things I saw on, on, on the future panels coming up today is we're really gonna be looking and talking about what we need to be doing in the future. Kind of one of the things that COVID allowed us to do is it allowed us to innovate in a way that we would not have normally done. And so, telehealth as a model, really looking to see what can telehealth do to help us expand the reach of our workforce? What can the use of peers do to help us expand the reach of the workforce? What can the use of lived experience do in policy and advocacy and making sure that we are really representing the needs of the people that we are all here to serve. So I, I'm very excited about the rest of your agenda. I think it really, uh, it looks great. Um, and uh, I think there's, there's a lot of great information and, and conversation that's gonna be happening. One thing I will leave you with, to those of you who have not yet done it, I really, again, from my both my federal experience and my state experience, I was at a, a, a wonderful provider that I had the opportunity to see yesterday. And I asked them, did you invite the state to come see your program? And they had not yet done it. Um, I very strongly encourage you, if you have programs that you think are working well, if you have policies that you wish were implemented, invite the policymakers to see them, invite the policymakers to hear you. Um, they're not going to come if not invited, but they won't say no if they are invited. So I, I leave you with that. Um, I, I hope you have a great uh, conversation. Again, thank you so much for, for having uh, me here today and for having the mental health conversation also represented. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're about, we're going to get started with our first panel. Uh, my name is David Brand. As Natalie mentioned, I'm a reporter for WNYC, public radio station, and the new site Gothamist, where I cover housing. Also have a special focus on homelessness. Prior to my career in journalism, I worked as a licensed social worker, worked in supportive housing, uh, worked at a school in Canarsie, working with a lot of students who were homeless or unstably housed, also worked overnights at a, a women's shelter. And so you know, I was pleased to have this opportunity to participate in this panel with these amazing panelists and talk about something that's you know, been very important in my career and I think such an important issue in our city. So thanks for inviting me and thanks, for, uh, thanks to everyone for attending. Now I want to introduce our illustrious panel here. <laughs> Next one, we have Dr. Allison Grolnick, who is a psychiatrist who is currently working as a healthcare systems policy and executive coaching consultant in the homeless healthcare space. Charlie Willison is a political scientist studying the relationships between local politics, intergovernmental relations, and public health political decision making with a primary focus on homelessness. Dr. Fabian Larocque is an internist and a preventive medicine specialist with training in epidemiology and public health. She is currently the interim chief medical officer at the Department of Social Services. Will Woods is an active member of the consumer advocacy program at Urban Pathways. Using his own understanding of homelessness and listening to his neighbor's perspectives to inform advocacy efforts. He also works at Knock Knock Give a Sock and interns at the Open Hearts Initiative. And finally, we have Dr. Yinan Lan, a primary care physician who co-founded the Bellevue Primary Care Safety Net Clinic. She currently functions as the Medical Director of Homeless Health and New York City Health and Hospitals. 
And in addition to the clinics, Dr. Lan oversees the medical services on the H&H &H Street Medicine team. So I think we should give them all a round of applause to start. All right, so we're gonna get started with a presentation from Dr. LaRock talking about an overview of the healthcare system at the Department of Social Services. Take it away, Dr. LaRock. Smart. Oops. <laughs> Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Care for the Homeless, George, um, the board, for inviting us to be part of this panel. I'm going to start with the background of landscape of homeless services and medical needs among our population. So just as a reminder, for those who don't know it, New York City is not only a sanctuary city, as we all know now, if we didn't before, but also a city where there's a right to shelter. So anyone who needs shelter on any given day can go to one of our intake centers and they will receive a bed that night. Our mission is to provide temporary shelter and really mainly support our client to access permanent housing. We also provide case management, housing placement, security, food clinic, um, cleaning services, uh, and a host of other services. And we we also provide um, medical services and access to medical services. And uh, as you will see and hear later, a whole host of complex care coordination services. Now we have over 400 shelters uh, since uh, our new neighbors, migrants, started uh, arriving in the city. We've opened over 120 emergency sites. Uh, that makes us, our, our, our system is very dynamic. Shelters open, they close, client move. Um, and we are served by a multiplicity of shelter provider organization. Over 86 nonprofit and for-profit organizations are helping our shelter system. And this is in the landscape of New York City where there's 50 something hospital and hundreds of clinics and thousands of medical providers. So that you can see the complexity of um, uh, managing health for uh, some of the most disadvantaged uh, of our neighbors. So our system is composed of three main divisions, the adult services, family with children services, and street homelessness, although we just actually are undergoing a reorganization where we're gonna have intake and shelter services uh, grouped together. Uh, but essentially these are the three main population that we are serving, adult, single adult and adult families, families with children, and a person who are experiencing street homelessness. Our services include healthy meal, no matter what you've heard about our meal, they meet the food standards, <laughs> and our nutritionist, we have a nutritionist at DHS, and we actually have been doing testing, test, testing, uh, uh, food testing uh, of the uh, shelter meals, and I have participated in the food testing, and I can attest that they are actually can be eaten. They are actually fine. Um, we've eaten them. They be a, they may have a little, you know, not enough salt, but that's the New York City food standard. So we've actually been testing the food. We can attest that the food is fine. We provide access to benefits, social services, job training, supportive services, application for housing, referral, linkage to care. We do not have medical shelters. We do have shelters that have medical services on site. And our client, our single adult client must be independent. So over 90% of uh, homeless persons in New York City are in shelter, as opposed to a lot of the major city on the West Coast. Our daily census out of a few days ago was over 80,000. About a year ago, it was maybe about 46, 50,000. We've received tens of thousands of new migrants, so now our, our census is the highest it's been. And our street homeless estimate, the last one is out of uh, last year. I don't have the data for this year yet, but it's about 3,500. And the majority of our clients are among family with children. There's about 50,000 clients among family with children, and I want to say about 25,000 children under the age of 18. Um, the race, uh, ethnicity background, this is just to show you the difference between the New York City population, where 20 20% approximately are black, 28% Hispanic, 31% white non-Hispanic, whereas the DHS census, 56, almost 57% are black non-Hispanic, 32% Hispanic, and only 7% are white. So what to take of this is that homelessness and poverty is really a racism issue. Not a race issue, but really a racism issue that is, you know, started centuries ago and is continuing now. Uh, on when a client uh, arrive, we ask them a few basic questions about the health um, 
condition in overall in the shelter population, about 63% report a medical condition, uh, report a health condition, and 40% report a, uh, at least one medical condition. But really, on the right side of the slide, you can see the statistics for the single adult population, three quarters report at least a health condition, and 45% uh, at least a medical condition, and uh, 37% and 35% mental health and substance use condition. And this is what they actually admit to us, or they know that they have because they've been diagnosed with. It's a high, really, really a major underrepresentation. And so, so next slide is gonna show you the, some of the health condition among the senior adult uh, based on Medicaid data compared, so on the top, um, bars are single adult in the shelter system, and on the bottom bar are single adult Medicaid recipients that are not that were not homeless at the time. So almost or more than two thirds of our clients have that are single than the single adult system have cardiovascular disease. Forty six percent report hypertension, thirty two percent diabetes, uh, a, a quarter asthma, a third cerebrovascular disease, and you can see just visually that the rates are much much higher in the comparable Medicaid population. To so those are also low income individual, but their rates of chronic medical condition are much higher. The comparison with behavioral health condition is even more striking. 41% of our clients, single adult client report, or have been diagnosed with Medicaid data with chronic alcohol use, 66% uh, chronic substance use, 62% chronic mental illness, 51%, 51%, half of them have serious mental illness, and 43% have a combination of serious mental illness and either alcohol or substance use. Just take a look, those numbers are staggering. So it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult situation uh, in addition you know, to homelessness. And the comparison, I don't have to read the number to you, but you can see the, sing, the single adult comparison, the rates are much lower. Um, our mortality numbers continue to increase. We have a fantastically effective um, substance use and, and overdose um, death prevention program, but the overdose, we can't catch up with the overdose because of fentanyl and alzilazine. Uh, we continue to have a high rate of death through overdose. In fiscal year 22, we had almost 700 uh, deaths. And with the number goes because of there's been acute overdose followed by heart disease, accidents, uh, alcohol related, cancer, homicide, and suicide. So four of the five top cause of death are actually external and, and uh, violent or uh, an external cause of death. And our, our clients are dying uh, much, much sooner than the rest of us at 51 on average. So I'm gonna end here by listing some of the barriers to care that you know, we see from our side at, at DHS, obviously homelessness is the number one barriers, followed by limited or inadequate health insurance or barriers of the health insurance system themselves, denial, 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 uh, poverty, of course, health may not be their priority, they really wanna have a home, they wanna have a job, stigma everywhere, including in the healthcare system, our client, one of the main, one of my main job is really battling with the with, with hospital to not discharge our client too fast. Um, general accessibility and sufficient harm reduction approach, and, and I'm sure our colleagues are gonna mention many other barriers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Larocque. Will Woods, I wanna to turn to you after that presentation as someone who is, has this lived experience. And you know, Dr. Larock talked about the shelter system being dynamic and places closing. I guess that also means people moving around, people losing access to treatment or to getting new service providers, new treatment providers. And I wonder if you could talk about that and some of those obstacles that, that people in shelter and people receiving services experience. Certainly, it's rather frustrating um, actually trying to maintain your health when you're in the shelter system for multiple reasons. Uh, it could be something as simple as you've got your appointments and you're ready to go, but the employee that's designated to distribute MetroCard doesn't come in that day. Okay, it could be something as drastic as someone feeling that you're making things too difficult uh, in the day-to-day -day operations and deciding to move you on. I'll give you an example of what I mean, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease while I was in shelter. And um, for those that know, when you're going good, it's just fine. When you're not, it's really, really difficult to, to make it through a day. 
um, and I was going through a lot of appointments, a lot of uh, different uh, adjustments necessary, uh, whether that be getting a, a, an elevator pass because I was having difficulty with mobility, whether it be getting a day pass so that I could stay in the facility uh, during, during uh, day hours, um, or whether it be an adjustment to diet and nutrition. Uh, because I needed to have a, a different kind of diet. In fact, uh, all three of those recommendations from the new doctors that I got in the process uh, led to me getting three of those adjustments on consecutive days. And after the third, which was for the meal, that night when I got back to my bed, my transfer notice was in because I was frankly too complicated for that facility to handle. That's how it was phrased to me. Um, you know, but there's also barriers when it comes to who services you. Um, in, when I was in that shelter, I was in the Bronx. My GI was in Co-op City. Then I relocated to supportive housing in Astoria. GI was still in Co-op City, but still manageable. Post-COVID, my GI moved to Sheepshead Bay. I live near the Triborough Bridge. So that's a full day commitment when I need to go see my GI. And I'm fairly mobile. I'm familiar with the city. I'm still young enough where I can do what I need to do. So I can only imagine how complicated that would be for other aspects of the population. It's kind of things like that that make it very difficult to follow through on healthcare. And for a lot of folks going through it like me, it's not worth the hassle, honestly to go through it and to maintain their health. And a lot of folks don't do the necessary things to do to maintain themselves, which also leads to that, some of the problems that we see with age, with mortality and different things within the homeless population. How do you navigate that? That sounds so difficult, just, just the amount of travel to get from your doctor to the shelter, to the supportive housing site. It's, it's difficult. It takes a commitment. When you're lucky and you have uh, good opportunities like I do, you've got a great support system that kind of works together to make sure that you do what you have to do. Um, but it, it's, it's, also, it's also challenging. You really just need to make a choice about what is the priority for me today. You know? But even that is fraught. You know, because now, let's just say, I have to choose between the commitment to, to take care of my health and perhaps a housing interview or a job interview or, or something else that is of equal importance. Now I have to decide what it is that's going to be the priority in that time and figure that out. And then that's also something that's difficult for a lot of folks to navigate. What do you think the solution would be to make that, to make that less challenging? Well, Dream world, one of the things that I would love to happen, especially with the beginning of intake, uh, is to have a, a file, a, a comprehensive uh, whatever it is that actually follows you through your entire process from beginning to end, that can begin to be noted and, and, and updated beginning at intake, and it follows you from facility to facility. That way, if you switch programs, if you switch agencies, whatever it is, you're not starting over from zero, okay? You know, you're able to maintain different relationships and things like that, and also more support and understanding and connection between the different as services and administrations. Hey, look, this is going to be somebody that was here. Everything was being done this way. Now they're here, and it's being done this way. We're going to make that as seamless as possible because the person that we're trying to help needs to help. It's not about anything else but that. Well, thank you. I, I want to turn back to you, Dr. LaRock, based on what Will has said about his experience in, in the shelter system and all those uh, uh, people, I guess, and how the Department of Social Services is addressing that. Well, first of all, thank you, Will. And second of all, I agree. It's, it's difficult. I mean, you know, right, we each have one home and we don't have to move around. Imagine if we were in Will's situation. Uh, I totally agree. He, he's young uh, and he's still able to do it. but. Uh, those barriers exist, and uh, if you remember, uh, we mentioned we have over 400 shelters, over 80 uh, providers. So it's a it's a system that is inherently difficult to manage. I will not want to. It's, it's difficult to manage. Um, so what I have been doing? So the medical office, our office has expanded from a, a, a team of I don't know, seven or eight people when I started about six, six, seven years ago to over 30. And our merging with HRA is going to, you know, again increase our team. We've had um, really a, a wonderful team of innovators. So some of the things that we do, we hire a, a nutritionist. So we have to follow the New York City food standards you can ask for uh, reasonable accommodation for diet. 
Now, the devil is in the detail and in the execution, but our office is also a place where complaints can come if the diet is not followed. But uh, anyone is supposed to be able to obtain any one of the medical diet that they need. Um, the transfer issue is remain an issue. We uh, talk to our colleagues at DHS to really, when there is a transfer for you know, medical reason, mental health reason that we are involved, and we've been advocating for the transfer to be done in a more seamless way with one head off. We, we are not here yet, that, but, but that's where we, you know, we want to go with you know, one head off with the transfer. Um, Clients can stay in um, in shelter. We no longer send the uh, client out during the day. Uh, we do ask them to leave the door. So if somebody needs a bed pass, they, uh, they need to request a bed pass. Yes, I know that that's a lot of but they can. Yes, but they can request a bed pass. And I guess the issue is that every you know one shelter, you know one shelter, and the staff is um, the salaries are low. There's a lot of frustration all around, and um, we. How we address that between our shelter system on mental health first aid. Um, four years ago, uh, the workforce turnover, we need to do it again and again and again. We, uh, COVID, yes, brought opportunity, but also offended a lot of the work that we've been doing. We have uh, developed standard training for our staff. So we need to continue training. We need to continue uh, good oversight of the, of the services. And uh, lastly, uh, we have and we are growing a complex care coordination program to really help with navigation. Um, and it's in small, but we've opened a health grant. We are obtaining um, um, staff from health and hospitals. We are working very closely with them. We are increasing our complex care our program to help clients that have complex need navigate the system. So shelters in it was always possible, but more and more shelters can reach out to us to the medical office. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not myself to help with complex cases. So it's slow, but we are making progress. Thank you. I want to turn to Dr. Lan. Uh, Dr. LaRock mentioned health and hospitals and public hospital system has such a key role in providing health care to people experiencing homelessness, uh, people unstably housed. How is the system working now and, and making it easier for people to maintain their care and, and to get access to care? Yes. Hello. Um, First of all, it's really good to be here. This is bringing back a lot of memories. I was just talking with Mr. Shana um, that about 10 years ago, um, I was you know, working as a, uh, a Bellevue Hospital primary care physician and trying to learn everything I can about homeless health um, and reached out to Bobby Watts at that time from CFH, um, who was the president. And uh, he said, come on over to my office and I'll tell you everything I know about homeless health. And then so that happened um, and uh, the landscape of what happen, what exists, and, uh, and largely, you know, there are so many programs at, at that time already uh, that were shelter-based and community-based to do intervention, um, and then from my experience as a public hospital physician, um, it was clear that that did not extend to the ho public hospital system yet at that time. So we're watching people um, who are going through emergency room, who are getting admitted again and again, um, and going through this revolving door that, that we've heard about, right, through the um, hospital system, through um, discharge at nursing homes, through, um, you know, jail, prison, through um, other kind of facility shelter system. And then um, at the end, they're not landing to a better place and in, in, in that results in better well-being. Um, so, when we look at that, uh, it could be quite depressing and demoralizing, especially for our, you know, uh, our, our people who are living through that, um, and also for the provider who are providing the care, even though acute care are being provided, but it does not generate to a wellness at the end. Um, it can also be viewed as an opportunity um, in that for health and hospital, the public hospital system of New York City, um, there's 11 different um, hospitals within New York City, and we see close to 50,000 people who are living through homelessness. And a portion of that are experiencing through a very acute type of um, homeless experience in that 
things are starting to unravel in that the just prolonged relentless exposure to unstable housing either that means on the street where you're exposed to the elements or it means transferring between different shelters where you're different dealing with different environments um, causes that unraveling of chronic diseases that Dr. Larock was talking about that, that Will was experiencing um, in terms of mental health and chronic diseases and that unraveling can be really hard to kind of navigate on your own, is, is, um, I can imagine that, that that might be uh, what sounds like a, a drowning experience. Um, the hospital system, however, um, does have this opportunity in that a lot of the acute care uh, in terms of emergency room inpatient um, and our primary care in addition to specialty care are lined up in one place, which provides the opportunity to engage people when they're going through their um, worst stages um, of that crisis. Um, and this is sort of the, the opportunity that, that we looked at uh, in the past few years uh, when we kind of started to say, okay, this need, we need a continuity. We need what Will was talking about, someone that follows me through this period of time when I can cannot you know, navigate this uh, up by myself when none of us could do that uh, on our own. Um, and that's the idea behind complex care or the safety net clinic that, that you know, the, um, we are kind of structurally building into uh, the primary care system, but also implementing uh, mental health in to include psychiatry and then uh, a sort of a, a wraparound service that provides kind of uh, looking into social benefit housing um, piece and medical piece and then um, making sure that things are in one place. That concept is not new, um, you know, not only from the outpatient world, but from the inpatient world. If any of us are, you know, um, kind of crit critically injured or um, for whatever reason, we go to the ICU where everything's in one place. And that's a similar concept for the outpatient world when people are going through, uh, uh, you know, this very complicated experience. Um, with the idea that eventually we graduate people to community-based uh, primary care or other, you know, continuous healthcare pro programs. Um, many pieces also involved with that, that I'm sure we'll touch us on a little bit more. Um, but I think um, in order for us to build a, you know, we have to start somewhere uh, in terms of building a um, um, effective safety net uh, system. And um, um, it makes sense to start with people who are experiencing the sickest and most complex form uh, of poverty and medical conditions. Um, and that's what uh, we're kind of hoping to do right now. What do you think the role of the hospital system is in, in, in helping people get permanent housing, stable housing? And uh, housing and health um, are two inseparable uh, sort of elements. And uh, I was uh, I'm smiling because I'm looking at our uh, Housing for Health uh, you know, representative today, uh, Marjorie, um, who actually uh, works on the medical respite piece within Health and Hospital. Um, and we were just chatting before this panel on how we can line up so much of healthcare. And if we're missing that housing element, things just don't work. It's kind of like, um, you know, trying to line up um, everything but the solution uh, to, uh, to this. So this is why I think our uh, team and many other people here from H&H &H are, are, are here. Uh, there's a huge force that, that's sort of like looking at it and, and looking at how do we not only work together, so this is sort of like a conversation about collaboration, um, not just meetings to say, great, like, you know, this is what you do, this is what I do, um, but really painfully kind of, you know, work through to say, how do I change my system? How do you change your system so that we are aligned on many levels, especially when it comes to vacancy for, for housing and access. Thank you. Charlie, I want to turn to you. And what, what's the role of Medicaid in increasing access to health services, especially for people experiencing homelessness? Um, can you tell us what New York can learn from other states? Yeah, so um, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, with this esteemed panel. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you about Medicaid because it's such an integral piece of all of this. And I think it's a really interesting way of thinking about how different systems can connect together, um, how they have already connected together, um, but how we can also create more opportunities to continue to connect them together. Um, so first, uh, Medicaid is an insurance provider. Um, it's one of the nation's um, primary uh, public or government-funded insurance providers, um, and it provides um, the most amount of coverage for low-income uh, people in the United States. Importantly, prior to the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, um, uh, single adults, broadly, were not eligible for Medicaid. Uh, and so when we think about um, people experiencing homelessness or people who might be at risk of experiencing homelessness, um, 
med uh, medical needs is a huge part of this, um, and especially when people are experiencing homelessness, longer durations of homelessness, um, people over time will continue to experience uh, more and more adverse medical conditions um, for a variety of reasons, um, uh, obviously being just the realities of experiencing homelessness and then everything everyone is talking about, about the challenges of accessing care itself. So with uh, the Affordable Care Act came the opportunity of Medicaid expansion. And this is where different states uh, essentially had the choice um, to decide to um, expand um, their Medicaid programs. Uh, this is an insurance program that is a partnership between the federal government and states to include expanded eligibility, including to uh, single adults, um, up to 138% of the federal poverty line. Um, and a lot of advocates said that Medicaid expansion was kind of like a silver bullet for helping people who are experiencing homelessness because now, prior to Medicaid expansion, most people experiencing homelessness or at risk of experiencing homelessness were uninsured. Uh, that's huge. And so Medicaid expansion gave people the opportunity to get insurance uh, for the first time in many cases. Now, again, you know, this is just an expansion states. Right now, uh, 41 states have expanded Medicaid, but there are still some, some holdout states. Uh, New York State was one of the early expansion states. So getting access to health care or health insurance so you can then get access to health care um, is kind of a, a first step. And again, especially thinking about um, people with chronic medical conditions, uh, the, the serious behavioral health needs, um, facing people um, experiencing homelessness. Uh, so Medicaid uh, is, a, is a really, really big boost it's also a big boost to the systems. Um, so when we think about uh, uncompensated care or when people don't have health insurance, those costs. So Medicaid also provided um, buffers to different systems where now care that wouldn't have been paid for um, gets, gets paid for. Um, but the, the last thing I'll say just to wrap up is that Medicaid also has the opportunity and in different ways and in different places as doing some kind of unique things or providing unique opportunities to increase access to care, but also some other services that we wouldn't normally think of. Um, and this actually includes housing. Uh, so Medicaid um, has, a, has a different things called waivers, where states can apply um, the two the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to kind of uh, bend the rules and try and use Medicaid funding in different ways. And uh, 1115 waivers are one example. This um, actually allows States, in many cases, to help pay for different types of housing costs. New York State has had uh, an 1115 waiver, um, not specific, not directly targeting people experiencing homelessness, but um, broadly thinking about how to improve access to care for um, at-risk groups um, or marginalized populations, low-income populations, since 1997. Um, and it's actually helped fund a lot of the supportive housing units um, in New York State and in New York City, um, which is which is pretty awesome. But now, and this is this is where I'll stop. But um, other states, I believe there are four or five right now. Um, California is one of the leaders of this, who actually have Medicaid waivers that are uh, specifically designated uh, for people experiencing homelessness to um, include more comprehensive benefits. Um, focus on housing and supportive housing and housing first, specifically for people experiencing homelessness, and then start to address some of these other barriers that we're seeing about this disconnected or fragmented system. So why doesn't New York do more of that? If there is, seems to be this groundswell behind the idea of, you know, if housing is the most effective prescription for healthcare, why doesn't New York tap Medicaid to pay for housing? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I know that um, New York has definitely, uh, most recently, been thinking about um, doing more in this space. So, uh, I'm not sure if they're talking about doing a homeless-specific waiver, but thinking about including um, more emphasis on Medicaid spending for people experiencing homelessness specifically, which is really exciting. And I think that there uh, would hopefully be a lot of support for it, given the history of Medicaid investments uh, in supportive housing across New York State, and really specifically in New York City. Um, one of the things that I think New York State uh, and New York City can really learn from, California has a Medicaid waiver called whole person care. And I want to bring this up because I think it's, uh, it's talking about a lot of these issues that we're all thinking about. 
Um, and this ran, I believe, uh, from 2016 um, to about 2020, um, maybe, maybe a couple years later. Uh, but uh, what it did was it essentially worked to create a hub across healthcare providers, shelter services, or the continuum of care, um, and, and other access points um, to, to create kind of like a, a one, one point and also coordinate the records, uh, like Lil was talking about, so people don't have to go from one place to another, re-explain their situation, move their medical records around. And once they did this, helped fill in the gaps of care coordination and transition between hospitals, between shelters, between emergency departments, they actually saw a reduced emergency department service use um, and um, improved access to primary care visits and other specialty services, including behavioral health. And so this is where um, New York's interest in this, hopefully, um, and I think this is a great place to have this conversation in this room, is really to think about um, the advocacy opportunities that are coming up, um, the four ways that we can emphasize um, this need and these different resources that are available. Thank you. You know, we've talked a lot about gaps and, and lack of continuity, and Dr. Grolnick, you've done a lot of I think pioneering work on telehealth for many years with Project Renewal, and that's something obviously so important during the COVID pandemic. Can you talk to us about telehealth and how that works to fill in some of these gaps? Sure. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Um, you know, Will mentioned a really important experience of someone who is popping from shelter to shelter or doctor to doctor. Um, Dr. Morak mentioned how robust the system is, but sometimes geographically spread. As we know, throughout the city, um, there's workforce, um, as we well know, workforce shortages. And so telehealth, as we, you know, was mentioned in the keynote address, um, the pandemic really presented a unique opportunity to innovate with lots of regulatory rollback that happened. And so telehealth can really do um, a lot of efficiencies as people are, you know, throughout the city um, to help with workforce shortages, um, when, for continuity of care as providers are going, you know, as um, people are going from uh, location to location. So, you know, one thing, um, Dr. Lorak also mentioned there are many shelters throughout the system, as we all know, federally qualified health centers, care for homeless, or the criminal, many others in the city um, that have uh, clinics that are embedded into the shelters. And the idea there is to really provide an opportunity for people to have low barrier, um, low threshold care, no matter how they enter, to have integrated care um, in the primary care setting with behavioral health, psychiatry, substance treatment program. Um, and telehealth can, again, ensure continuity of care, um, to help facilitate um, specialty uh, continuity of care to close the loop, as we know, um, when referrals are made between the hospital systems um, that are robust in the specialty care, and to really incorporate a lot of the specialty care into that um, location. Like I said, you know, behavioral health, but also have C treatment, um, gender affirming care. And again, telehealth can really, um, when, when properly reimbursed, and I know um, there's some advocacy that can be done there, um, can really fill the gaps in the system. Can you talk about what's, what's the problem with reimbursement? Yeah. <laughs> I hear the chuckles from okay. the audience. Um, so during the pandemic, a lot of regulatory rollback um, occurred where people had access to care, um, really sort of Pandora's box opened. You could provide care no matter where the provider sat, no matter where the um, consumer sat, and we really were able to sort of um, meet the needs that were, you know, very prominent during that time without, and maintain reimbursement. Um, I think now in, you know, the most recent budget, some of the Restrictions are being put back into place in terms of where a provider sits and where um, a patient consumer sits. Um, and so it just it further challenges the operational and sustainability of um, uh, a nice tool in the toolbox um, for continuity of care and, and things within the system that um, just make it really challenging. Does anyone want to add to that, especially on the, the Medicaid side, Charlie, if that's something that uh 
Sure. So yes, um, green versus race uh, are obviously a, a huge, a huge issue. Um, I'll talk about federally qualified healthcare centers really quickly. So um, when uh, Medicaid expansion happened, uh, the federal government was obviously anticipating that hopefully a lot of people would enroll. There would be more people who needed access to healthcare, um, and then we needed to think about where do these people go. And so there's a funding stream um, specific to provide um, essentially fund to, to build federally qualified healthcare centers and also give them a high reimbursement rate through Medicaid, but they have to meet a lot of really specific criteria. And so if we're thinking about um, how different types of health organizations can benefit um, structurally or institutionally from Medicaid, um, a lot of smaller places aren't necessarily able to do that or to, to accept Medicaid or to be able to benefit from these different funding streams because they might not have the capacity or the staff um, to build these systems or to even necessarily bill for Medicaid. Um, thinking about other providers, um, I mean, um, Medicaid doesn't reimburse as high as private plans, and so there can be a disincentive for different providers to uh, to accept Medicaid um, as a payer. Um, and what um, uh, I find in my research and a lot of other folks find too is that across the country, um, and I'd love to hear Ellen's uh, take on New York City as well, um, this can obviously really hamper um, access to care for people experiencing homelessness um, because you have to look around who's going to accept this and then you can end up traveling across the city um, and trying to find uh, different providers in your network. So reimbursement rates was really a really important part of the, the conversation. <laughs> One of the biggest issues in the city right now is the rise of uh, newly arriving immigrants entering the shelter system, utilizing city services. Uh, and Dr. Rock, you mentioned it in your presentation. So how is that affecting uh, healthcare delivery in the DSS system? And how are you working with other uh, agencies in the city to make sure people are getting care? Yeah, Max, here, uh, from the OHMH. Uh, so it's a real problem, say, well, tens of thousands of individuals who are uninsured. How we've addressed the issue is uh, providing them information, so we work with uh, HMH, we work with DOHMH to put together packages of information that include uh, flyers on how to access uh, express care, telehealth, uh, uh, yeah, HNH, mm -hmm. HNH facilities themselves, and they want to health centers, so we distribute those material to uh, the providers that are overseeing uh, these shelters. We um, have uh, welcome uh, many efforts from the Department of Health. So we, uh, they have come uh, to vaccinate, to provide vaccination um, for uh, childhood vaccination, uh, COVID vaccination is offered. The uh, DOE generation, we are working together to do tuberculosis screening. So some of the issues that affect the new migrant populations that in their country of origin, they have a lower rate of uh, basic vaccination. Then in the United States, they also have a higher rate of infection with tuberculosis. Also other, other infections, including child vaccine preventable infections. So we have a higher rate. Um, we've seen a, I don't want to say explosion, but we've seen a number of cases of chickenpox, varicella among uh, our families, uh, new uh, uh, migrants. So, DOHMH is working really, really, really hard to investigate every case, every contact, and they work closely with our shelter system. Our office help navigate and coordinate all of this effort so to avoid outbreaks. So, we do a lot of contact and, and uh, uh, case investigation with uh, Varicella. We help coordinate. Um, Vaccination, uh, tuberculosis. Uh, we also work with the maternal uh, infant uh, and child system at DOHMH to do just basic screening. They screen thousands of families and make down tens of thousands of um, uh, referral and linkage to care. Um, we work with public health solution. We work with we work with Hunger Free America to improve access to uh, food and supplement supplemental nutrition for our families with children. We have um, a position funded by the city who's a health monitor in our office for the migrant system. So we started doing home visits, I mean, uh, shelter visits, site visits at the shelters. We uh, talk to the uh, shelter providers, we give them all resources again. Uh, but ultimately, um, they don't need Medicaid. They don't need to have a job to be able to you know, go on their own. How would uh, curtailing the right to shelter in New York City affect? 
healthcare and healthcare delivery, especially for, for migrants. How about uh, right, like the Adams administration moving to suspend the right to shelter if they were not able to afford it, I guess, is the, the terminology they're using. Well, so far we've been able to afford it. Um, it's a good question. I don't, I can't speak for the Adams administration, even though I'm part of the Adams administration, but I can imagine us leaving our newly arrived or newly homeless anyone from anywhere on the street, so they'll be somewhere, I'm imagining, this is again me speaking. Um, but when there is no space, there is no space. You know, there's something about space that's actually physical, so we can't define the laws of physics. And so if there is no more hotel that will, or hotel owner that will rent to us, if there is no more room, and we can't go to school because the parents are you know, unhappy, we can't go to certain neighborhood because others are unhappy, the state doesn't want to help. You know, the, the, the um, other counties, the state counties are, are willing to help, the other states don't want to help, the federal government is mom. Uh, so I think it's, it's a whole country effort, really, that we need to get into, uh, starting from the right to work. My, I'm an immigrant myself. We don't want to come here for benefit, and we don't want to come here to sit around ourselves. We want to come here to work, send money back home, and send our kids to law school. I mean, our goal is that. Entering chief medical officer of TSS. I mean, I'm very proud of it, but I'm also an immigrant. Yes, I didn't come from the border. I came with a fellowship. I was one of those lucky ones. But essentially, we've done work with, with migrants, immigrants. They do not come for the benefit. So, we really, the urge is if anybody is from the federal government or anybody here, they need the right to work. They will work and they will do the job that the rest of us don't want to do and they will help the economy. Thank you. Dr. Lan, similar question. How is your work being affected by rise in the number of newly arriving immigrants in, uh, in need of services? And is, is there a change? Is that is kind of continuing what you have always been doing? Yeah, I think it highlights something that actually has always been happening. Um, the new wave uh, sort of gets um, um, a lot of, sort of media attention and conversation about it. Um, at the same time, it touches on sort of this legal health, uh, you know, partnership in that um, without sort of that understanding or that piece of the support, which is, you know, this com whole conversation with NILAG, with an organization that was very robust um, in looking into um, the sort of legal assistance and um, other form of assistance, uh, especially for, for our patients who are not documented. We see this huge resource gap um, that's not covered by Medicaid or, or any other sort of uh, pocket. Health and hospital provides medical care um, without any problem to people who are not documented, but when it comes to benefit, that's where the, the gap lacks. And that's when it comes to you know housing and everything else, the other pieces. Um, that's when I'm looking at some of the health and hospital teams here who are working really closely um, to figure out uh, uh, emergency sh uh, sort of shelter or medical care uh, for the meantime. Um, but at the same time, what does that mean for long term for our larger pocket of, of patients who are, uh, who doesn't have documentation? Um, I don't have a, a good solution yet, um, but I think that's sort of the aim that we're looking at to say that with our resources, that's sort of our job, is that we, we refashion resources to see how does it work to fit uh, people who are having different sort of a, a background experiences or you know documentation status. And Dr. Grolnick, you know, we're seeing the shelter census rise, the number of homeless New Yorkers increasing pretty dramatically. At the same time, we're seeing kind of staff. How is that affecting your work and how do you overcome that? Well, I think um, in terms of the landscape, this is affecting the entire landscape. I think workforce shortage and straining of workforce in terms of morale and all of that has been, you know, um, a challenge. At, you know, I see nods in the um, in the audience, and I think no matter where you are in the landscape, you, you've experienced it. Um, I think now more than ever, you know, there are ways to address workforce shortages in terms of efficiencies, again, with, you know, telehealth and other innovations that you can, um, you know, make the work more efficient throughout the city with, with something like telehealth. But, you know, and Dr. Rock mentioned it earlier in terms of trainings, um, 
you know, funding and loan forgiveness programs, different incentives that have always been there, but I think uh, now more than ever, you know, really sort of refocusing on and paying attention to this as urgently as the rest of the system strains, um, because without the workforce, you know, it's hard to solve a lot of these other system issues. And Will, you know, we talk a lot about like crises and problems, and there are so many gaps as we've all discussed. I wonder what's working or what has worked for you or what do you think is promising when it comes to healthcare delivery and, and access? I, I think that having this kind of new comprehensive effort, you know, this, 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 this all hands on deck approach has certainly uh, been helpful. You know, it's, it's not anything that's new. You know, once upon a time, the best, probably the best border program I had was a provider that had medical uh, site and social all on my team. And they collaborated together, you know, to create the service plan along with me. But, you know, but the fact that all three of those components were in touch, you know, made things easier because they could also relay things to each other. You know what? Okay, well, he's having a bad day, you know, but it's a bad, you know, but well now, but my site can ring it. Okay, well, you know what, there's this and this and this components to be aware of. My caseworker might be able to come back and say, well, listen, I've been noticing that he's been dealing with this, 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 and this. So next time that you talk to him, can you bring up that? The nurse practitioner being on site daily, like, you know what, you don't look right, come talk to me. You know, that kind of thing yeah. is, is really, really super important. Because here's the thing. You got so many other things going on while you're trying to rebuild your life, while you're going through this journey of homelessness. Like you, you sometimes you don't even know what you're missing, what you're not aware of, what what it is, you know. And all those many of these lovely people deal with so many of us on a daily basis. That that ability to be able to very very quickly be able to say, hey, you know what? I know that there's a problem there and let's now, you know, focus our resources to serving that need is is super important. Uh, you, you become an um person so quickly. So also the fact that you've got people that you know are committed to wanting to help you also helps you help yourself. You know, it's like, you know what, I, I, I know I'm doing this for me, but I'm also not gonna let my team down, kind of deal, you know? And it's it, and they're there for you as well. Like, you know what, I know I you know I know this and this and this about you, and here's how we're going to work. So, you know, the, the more that we can make it, a, you know, the more that we keep bringing it back to a person-centric focus, you know, and that includes even the housing component, because I'm not gonna worry about anything else unless I know that I have some place, some sense of security in my day-to-day. You know, I know that my stuff is going to be there, things like that. You know, it, it, it's all going to kind of help break some of this cycle, you know, that we're in, where you've got, where you've got folks that have got a critical need or they're already part of an underserved population and they go through this next thing. And, and, and it, 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 it's a way for us to kind of, you know, remember that even though we're talking about homelessness and we're talking about mental health and these big monolithic things, it all comes back to people. You know, and if you know, with it, when we start working on helping one person at a time, that's when we start to break it down. Well, I'd like to pose that question to everyone because I think that I think that's an important one. Like, what, what? Maybe Charlie, you go next. What do you think is working, or what do you see as 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 a prom promising? Yeah, so um, just thinking back up of that last point that Bill made, um, the, the systems or the opportunities um, where there is uh, coordination, but also not just coordination, but specifically putting the emphasis um, on uh, the people who are in need, as opposed to putting the responsibility on the people who are in need. Um, and oftentimes, one of the biggest failures that we see with Medicaid is people are eligible, but they can't actually use their services, they can't actually access their services, because they're required to jump through all these hoops, all these different administrative things, you know, even from, do you have an address? Um, you know, if you're moved in just across a, a county border jurisdiction, you can either not be able to access services, or you can be disenrolled from Medicaid quite quickly. And so it's so many different things 
to keep up on that is really putting the burden of responsibility on people who are going through so much in this an unimaginable way. And so the things that work really, really well, and this is what the, the California Whole Person Care Waiver did, was recentering um, on, on the systems and the responsibility on the systems themselves um, to take that burden off of the patients and the clients, um, to do those coordination um, uh, and, and to, to set up sites where people can go, they can access things all at the same time, um, and again, uh, alleviate these administrative burdens or these different hoops um, where the system is doing that instead of the people themselves. And that's what seems to uh, work really, really, really well. What do you think, Dr. Gromnick? Yeah, I agree. I mean, the fact that, um, you know, we're, we're having this conversation and these, these systems that we talked about, the landscapes in terms of the shelter system and the hospital systems and the FQHCs, they're embedded in the shelters. They, they are, I think, talking more than ever. And the people in the audience that I see from, you know, having a real desire to keep it person-centered and to do the best in terms of you know, how we can interact and work together and really have it as fluid as possible. Um, I think there, you know, there still are some administrative burdens that prevent um, that coordination. The record system, I think, is one thing that will mention that um, despite really significant and, you know, robust efforts to make it centralized with RIOs and, and other things across the system, I think it's still a barrier. But, the conversations are happening more. There's definitely more interaction between hospital systems and community-based providers. Um, you know, I've been in, working in the landscape for over 15 years, and I think just within that period of time, you know, the strides have been really fantastic. Um, there's still work to be done, um, and you know, advocacy in terms of what regulatory um, restrictions prevent some of the integration that has been talked about. You know, there, there's a lot of really great efforts with this group and now with other, you know, um, codes to reimburse for integration. Um, so I think there's really great, fantastic movement in the right direction and, you know, what can we do together to continue to innovate and to break down some of those regulatory barriers that prevent, um, you know, from, from moving forward, but I think really has um, come and in just a minute, we're going to move to uh, audience question and answer session. But Dr. Rock, I want to ask you if there's something that you think is working and that you want to highlight that Department of Social Services is doing when it comes to, to healthcare delivery. Uh, sure. First, I want to say that we'll set it all, and I want to have a team because that is all what's needed and what's working. So we've taken a systems approach, really. It's working together. So we have a nurse navigator program that is identifying client with complex need to support. We have a complex care program where we take a whole person approach with multidisciplinary uh, uh, communication to really get to the bottom of what is the barriers. We, our collaboration with Health and Hospital is really outstanding and quite unique in the last few years. They're even going to fund us for staff in our office and at DHS to help client uh, hands-on uh, our work with the state's net clinic. Uh, so really, it's a whole system approach and the, the innovation of merging the DHS medical office and the HRA medical office to bring more resources to the department. But I really want to highlight that we are looking at the systematically, like you say, not one person at a time, but how can we change the system to really improve access to services and bring services to clients? Mm -hmm. So the volume, the healthcare system is, I mean, it's New York City, right? The healthcare system is there. It's just not accessible, even though it might be across the street because the navigating the barriers is really one of the things that's really important and it's, it's starting to work. And Dr. Lan, you want to answer that question? A lot of work to be done and really good work, um, as Fabia mentioned. Um, my takeaway sort of for um, are, uh, as the public hospital system uh, looking at homeless health um, is, uh, again, effective collaboration that, that you know, we're um, doing with DHS, also with other community-based organizations. As mentioned, it's not meant to be an, an easy collaboration because we're looking at how to get, you know, database, how to be interoperable, how to have this sort of same platform of functioning. Um, and then housing, and which is, you know, very uh, area that, that we're 
working in from healthcare angle, uh, especially focusing in, which is, which is on the third piece, um, our patients who are with the highest need right now. Um, so that complex angle uh, is sort of uh, the uh, our initial focus of building that effective safety net um, starting somewhere. Well, I think you mentioned in your comments earlier, like we can dance around so many solutions around healthcare, but it's housing is the, is the true solution. And I guess expanding access to housing to housing, getting people into housing as fast as possible, bring more housing online. Um, it's kind of my takeaway from this panel. I want to open it up to the audience. We have a few minutes for question and answer. If anyone, uh, oh, sorry, we have questions on. Oh, nice, okay. All right, creating behavioral health and primary care and specialty care. What does that look like and what is the impact? Yeah, so great question. Um, I think that, you know, um, as many people know in the audience, um, some of the challenges with integration of licensure. So you have Article 28, the primary care clinic, you have an Article 31, a mental health clinic, and how do we um, get the two to merge? So um, I think that integrating care is key. We, we've heard a lot today um, to sort of have a one stop trust stop shop approach, um, no matter how people enter the door. Um, and that's a lot of what um, you know I did as part of renewal as the chief medical officer, really integrating in psychiatry into the primary care clinic um, so that um, you know no matter what the person you came in for, um, we could sort of meet the need um, in an easy way. Um, and so, you know, and not just baby girl health, as we, you know, as we know, the, the complex um, care that, that people who are experiencing homelessness need, you know, as many specialty care um, uh, that you can provide on site in terms of taxi, gender friendly care, um, and psychiatry within a primary care clinic can limit um, the need to refer out to another location for specialty care. Now, it's not. Um, it's not always going to be, obviously, um, people with complex needs need specialty care locations, but I think, um, you know, really, truly trying to integrate as much into one location as possible to meet as many needs as possible, um, you know, limits the amount of um, hopping around that you need to do throughout the city, um, especially when someone doesn't show up with their metro card. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Willison, and I have to apologize, I didn't that totally screw that up and referring to you. You don't go to school for like uh, 10 years to be called by your first name on a panel. So uh, this is a question for you. The SDOH Social Cares Network within the proposed 1115 waiver should work as a hub to form a network of CBOs. Can you repeat the similar models that have been successful in driving health access to homeless individuals? Yeah, um, so this is definitely um, a very exciting opportunity. There are more states um, that are looking in and incorporating the social determinants of health um, into Medicaid waivers, um, and this is just a, a new emphasis of kind of these pre-existing programs. Um, right now, uh, I believe uh, Arizona, Arkansas, Utah, and California are the only ones that are online that are really thinking about uh, uh, doing this, and it is focused on this this integration, um, like everyone's talking about, across community organizations, um, but not just healthcare, but the, the social services and other things like this. And this, um, I know I've mentioned that a couple of times, um, the school procedure waiver um, that was in the state of California, it was really centered around San Francisco and was for specifically people experiencing homelessness. And so just thinking about it, um, and I, I bring it up because this is um, one of uh, the only pilot models that we've seen and have data on about how well it worked, um, how it, it didn't work. There were obviously still lots of different implementation challenges, disenrollment being a huge part of it. But as far as thinking about connecting across these services, um, it did work well and we did see improved outcomes in terms of access to care, access to social services, and really just, again, improving the coordination between these systems that are, are totally separate and are functionally separate, um, really across the country when we're thinking about um, the, the shelter system, 
healthcare, criminal justice, other types of social services, but that when people are experiencing homelessness, they're interacting with all these different systems, and all these different systems are interacting with them and pulling you in different ways. And so I think it's a really exciting model. Um, there are also a lot of pending waivers currently, so I think going forward, um, hopefully more, more states uh, will, will apply, and more counties will think about applying, um, so we can continue to expand this model. Thank you. Now this is a question from the audience that's, I think, pretty open-ended, and I think well, I'm going to just open it up to the panel. Why is healthcare, advocacy, and shelter so complicated, and how might white supremacy have? What might white supremacy have to do with all of this? And maybe Dr. Larocque, we'll start with you because you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned in your presentation it's a it's an issue of, of oh. racism. Um, what does white supremacy have to do with? What well, white supremacy have to do with why they are each other in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's the beginning of that. Uh, white supremacy has to do why they are not enough uh, doctors of color, why they are not enough professionals of color, why they are not enough uh, Congress um, people and senators of color. I mean, the more women, I don't mean lobbying the women with that nice group. <laughs> um, the more women and people of color are in power, the better we're going to be. Um, in terms of the first part of the question, access, access to care. So I think it's all wrapped up in the same social uh, disaster, I guess, um, where uh, by the time you are in shelter. Also, remember that by the time you are in shelter, everything has failed you because that adult that is in shelter was a baby. Mm -hmm. It was somebody's pregnancy that probably didn't get adequate care. It was somebody's baby who was born innocent and not with mental illness, although mental illness can happen to anyone. Um, they were five year old, they went to school. So school failed them. How do we get somebody who is now 18 and can't read and was clearly had a developmental disability that clearly was could be seen when they were eight or ten or twelve, and now they are in shelter and they are just turning 23, 25, and now they can't ever be eligible for you know state or PWD services. They um, and so they, they don't. They, we all fail and they reach the healthcare system, maybe ACS clients. So um, it, it's hard to solve the healthcare problem of our clients by the time they arrive at us. It's, really late. it's like you know trying to cure stage four cancer. It, it's hard. You could have driven it. You could have driven it by you know healthy living and eating properly and stress. Do you know that stress itself actually affects your body biologically and that racism and stress together actually affect your blood cell, your cells physiologically. It's not like, oh my God, I'm stressed. It actually changes the way your body functions. And that starts, there's something called the intergenerational effect. So the way your mother was treated and the health of the mother will affect the health of the baby in the next generation. So that a college educated white person and a college educated black person don't have the same you know, health and the same outcome in life because it's generation from generation. So, we really need to look at society as a whole, and I, I'm hoping that some of the you know, social determinant of health network will help, but we really need to think about why are we so racist, and why is the school system, why are we so segregated, right? Why is the school that my kids went in Tribeca as a wonderful school, and everybody is happy, and why is the school in the South Bronx or somewhere else, you know? It, it, the outcome is different. We need to, we need to start from scratch. Thank you. Does anyone want to add? Just very quickly, I, 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 so much of that resonates with me, you know, but it, it speaks to this idea that there's also a massive educational opportunity. I come from a community where a lot of this is, is not discussed. Well, healthcare is not and you know it's not addressed on the level that it should be. You know there are a lot of systemic things that happen. I, you know, I, I suffer from several mental illnesses that have their root in how I was raised. You know that that's something that happened. Listen, my mom took care of my appointment for me up until I was independent. I, I, I 
to this day, there are certain sections of insurance documents that make no sense to me, you know? So, and that's not just me, that's my community as a whole, right? So we're already underserved, we're already marginalized, okay? We're already a higher percentage to experience homelessness. And all of these things are kind of all in a pressure cooker that kind of, you know, that develop in, in, into these other these other situations that you've got folks, you know, I, I, I talk with people all the time. Yeah, well, I know I should go to the doctor, but nah, I'm not. Okay, that doesn't really make sense to me, but you do you, you know, kind of deal. You know, but it, it, there's a lot of that. And if I'm having that conversation, that's conversations that caseworkers are having with clients, that's conversations that are happening when people are going to, you know, when they're attending their appointments and things like that. You can't, you can't get the best service, treatment, or attention if you don't know about it, if you don't understand it, if you don't know how to access it, if you don't know what your tools are, if you don't know how to, to flex in that way. And so when you don't know how to do that, you just kind of just stay in your same pool. You keep doing the same thing. And these problems are going to keep occurring until a lot of that other stuff is also addressed. Thank you. 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 Obviously, is, is a country that was founded on and continues to be developed with uh, maintaining racialized and gender hierarchies. And when we think about the built environment, the way that our cities are set up, um, thinking about segregation, this was very intentional. It was a very intentional act. Um, the cities were zoned to explicitly protect the privilege of white communities to protect their housing developments, their housing values, and their political uh, agency, and to explicitly restrict access to goods and services for communities of color. And so when we look around us, like why, why are things segregated, it was, on, it was on purpose. And so these political economies have persisted over time. And when we think about the root causes of homelessness, wealth disparities, access to housing, housing and restricted access to housing as a result of these generational wealth disparities between communities of color and white communities is really where it's at. And so um, ultimately getting to the root causes of this, um, bringing it back to, to the housing point that everyone has touched on, um, medical care um, must be uh, put together with this. And so thinking about the systems approach, um, and I think um, many people have mentioned this, I think Dr. LaRock really mentioned this, is thinking about looking at it as a system and where we're at uh, to move forward. Thank you. I guess we could actually do a time for one more question. And so this one, uh, this is, involves the use of telehealth. I think this is a really important question. It says, with the use of telehealth to fill in gaps and increase access to care regardless of location, what efforts have been made to expand access for all to the internet and devices to access telehealth in New York City? Um, I'm not sure who best to pose that question to, but I, I think, Will, the question that I would have is, do you think people who need access to telehealth are able to access it? And what do people need to, to make that work? Not as much as possibly could. Again, part of that plays into the economics of it all. You know, most of us nowadays, no matter level of income, have access to some kind of smartphone or other device. But even within that, the level and quality of that service is going to be negligible at best, you know, so just because I have to, this is not the best tool for access, uh, depending on location and, and setup, uh, you know, congregate care model doesn't need a lot of privacy to discuss medical issues, um, you know, when the person three feet away can hear everything that you're discussing with your doctor. Um, some of them, those locations, you know, if it's an older building, if it's in certain areas, you don't have great service. You know, so just be just because it's, it's available doesn't necessarily mean it's a tool that's easily accessible to folks, you know. And then there's there's also just a technological device, you know, the telehealth actually works out to be a great thing for my mom, you know, with regards to speaking up with her mental health depression. It took us about six months for her to be able to figure out how to do that without me being around, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's you know, so again, you know, you it, it's it, it's cool and it's great and it's a tool and when it's accessible, it's it's amazing, you know. But are we making sure that all the avenues for the use of that tool are are paid the correct way? Are we you know are we making 
keep coming back to this. There's so many educational opportunities, you know, and again, it's going to be stuff that crosses over. If that same level of education that might allow me to access that for my health, it's going to allow me to access employment, you know, housing, it's different things, but you know what, I, I was able to get to that because I learned from doing that. So, you know, and then also just, again, being aware that we're dealing with a, a large spectrum of people. What is simple and common and easily makes sense for me is not going to be the case for the next person and being aware of that. That's wrong. Uh, what efforts are being made to this? Right, so this is a fantastic question. You will, I think you once again hit on all of the important points. Um, but, you know, as we all have seen, calls are dropped. I mean, there's really um, service issues throughout the city um, in some of the shelters, in some of the housing programs, and this has to do with the service providers of the, of, you know, the um, of high speed access and all of that and fibers that are, in, you know, so it's complicated. Um, but also, so it's a, um, it's a digital divide in terms of access to devices or even, you know, knowing how to use them. So I think there's um, a few ways that you can, that, that we have collectively addressed this. I think that certainly utilizing people who have smartphones and know how to use them is the easiest low hanging fruit. Um, I think sometimes uh, congregate care can be a problem in terms of privacy, and so um, you know service providers like everyone sitting in the audience um, and others have you know really identified or tried to, despite limited space, um, private areas. They could be you know you have to get creative in very small private spaces, but at least something private um, to have a screen um, so that they can access their specialty provider at H and H. Um, you know, or at another health center. So, um, you know, really optimizing people who have the equipment, but then providing equipment and assistance with case managers and others to help people access, you know, Will does it for his mom, but most people, many people experiencing homelessness don't have that support network. And so the service providers, you know, in this room really sort of working as a surrogate to help people um, you know, make it easy and working with our fantastic IT departments to help um, mm -hmm. the providers know I'm really working together. But I think there's, you know, there's also mobile units that can, you know, go around um, that are fully licensed uh, Article 28 clinics that can help uh, provide service and care from people in the street, but then also um, have a small consultation room um, that can do telehealth as well. So it's an access problem in terms of uh, service, and then it's also the digital divide in terms of people understanding how to use the equipment and working together to um, you know, make it accessible to everyone. Well, I want to thank our panel here. It's a really great insight, and I think, uh, yeah, I a lot. I thank you, and thank you so much for the challenge. So, Dr. Allison Brony, Dr. Charlie Willis, and Dr. Fabian Morat, Will Woods, South Asian Alan, thank you all for participating. And where do we need more regulation and more oversight as these overarching questions to think about with all the topics that we go through today? So I want to start by talking about some alternative or low barrier models that would make primary and specialty care more accessible to people experiencing homelessness. And we can include behavioral health care in there as well, but let's think about particularly the aging population and people who have a disability. What are some of those alternative or low barrier models that would make care more accessible? Why aren't these models more widespread? And how do we change that? Uh, so I want to start with Giselle, and then we can maybe go to EJ to weigh in. Sure, thanks so much, Maya. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, you know, I think it's in general like important to step back and think about the importance of um, access to low barrier care. I think um, you know, over many years, there's been kind of a lot of hammering about the high use of emergency departments among people experiencing homelessness, but it's important to sort of ask why that might be the case, right? And think about what's important about having a place where someone can immediately walk in and get comprehensive care and immediate um, um, care for the issues that they're facing. 
So, um, and, you know, thinking too about if someone, even if they have a primary care provider, calling that person, setting up an appointment, maybe that appointment's going to be in two weeks. Do they have transportation to that appointment? So there's a lot of different things to think about when, um, you know, it's a, when we think about access to care and particularly the importance of low barrier care. And so I think different people propose different things. You know, some folks really focus on wanting to have care within the shelter system. Others talk about expanding access to community-based models. I think there are pros and cons to both of those. In an ideal world, we would really want both. Um, you know, we've talked with folks, um, you know, in the shelter system who it's great to have that access to on-site care, but as we've heard from the other panels um, and folks with lived experience, you know, you, you move around a lot in the shelter system, so if you get transferred, then what does your what does your continuity of care look like? Um, so, so I think it's important to think about different locations for care, whether it be shelter-based, whether it be community-based, based, but also making sure it's robust, making sure we have the providers available. Um, I think that's particularly important for behavioral health care. We do know that there's um, a huge lack of community-based behavioral health care, um, lack of providers um, in that space. And so one of the things also that came up on, on the other panel was um, implementing telehealth. Telehealth options, I think, are, are potentially promising, um, but it's important to take into account the specific needs of people experiencing homelessness when that's, if that's a specific um, program we want to uh, move forward with, including some of the things that came up before, you know, lack of privacy, maybe someone doesn't have a phone, or if they're transferred to, you know, a telehealth, do they have a video option? Um, and so those are, those are things that, that um, really should be thought about, and DHS is, is actually doing some work on um, highlighting telehealth within shelters. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just sort of stop there. Um, one other thing I can mention too is this potential need. There's a growing um, a potential expansion of this model, model called medical respite, which provides a place for folks who are um, who were in the hospital and are ready to be discharged but have some like significant care issues moving forward and to recuperate. Um, and if they're homeless, going back to the shelter or to the streets is extremely suboptimal for that recovery care. Um, and so medical respite is a model that um, Health and Hospitals has been contracted with a few service providers um, operating for a few years now, which provides a way uh, for people to have that space to recuperate. Um, and so we should be thinking about um, you know, how to expand that. There are, it's pol very policy relevant right now. The state is issuing regulations on medical respite and, and the process of issuing some pilot money to expand that. Um, but we should make sure that as we're doing that, we're thinking about best practices um, and how to evaluate those programs, making sure they're as good as they can be, um, and also the scope of the need, um, how many programs do we need, et cetera. So I'll stop it. Yeah, EJ, jump in. What, from your perspective as a shelter resident, are the kind of low barrier models of care that you wish you had access to or you think would address some of the significant hurdles like, you know, transportation costs? One of the things that I think is, is most important to just to here is the uh, continuation and strengthening of access to, uh, to telehealth. Um, some of the barriers of convention with regard to that, but in essence, I really feel it was it saved my life. Um, when I came into the system, I already had uh, medical issues. There was some difficulty in getting those accommodated for quite some time. However, on top of that, um, I was an early COVID uh, person and I had COVID twice. The good fortune for me was to be in a facility where there was on-site uh, medical care. But what if that weren't the case? You know, I had someone who was uh, overseeing and coordinating my um, other things that I needed. Now, once I moved beyond that, well, actually during that time, I was getting um, weekly counseling from the marvelous therapist. If you're not, uh, if you don't have some sort of mental health issue before you come into the system, it's my belief that once you're here, or at least for a while, you're going to have one, okay? And uh, maybe more than one, uh, for a number of reasons. So uh, being without permanent health in the first stressful 
it can be frustrating when you're trying to do the things that you believe you need to do in order to, uh, uh, to make some sort of progress. Um, but with regards to telehealth, <laughs> all of these things were certainly issues after I was no longer receiving COVID care. And with my counselor, that I, that, uh, I could then uh, see on the phone, and if we weren't able to see on the phone, excuse me, talk to on the phone without having to, uh, to make uh, a trip or um, be concerned about how am I going to be able to afford this. Uh, when I first came into the system and for an early, earlier part of, uh, of my, uh, my stay, I knew nothing about accessing it. For some reason, no one ever mentioned that, and I think that was what I thought earlier in the other time, that there, are, there may be a number of things that are available to you, but if you don't know about them, you can't, um, you can't use them. And on top of that, <laughs> I was told when I, uh, well, when I brought it to someone's attention, well, um, we didn't make enough, uh, we didn't, uh, didn't make enough, well, it wasn't the expression, the idea was that it was my fault that I didn't know about it. Is it right? Okay. Uh, let's see, there was something else I wanted to mention with the rest of that. But the other, anyway, to move along, the other piece that I, that is important to me, was thought of earlier too, and that is by wonderful Bill, okay. In order to need to coordinate services. Uh, plant lines here yeah, with regard to uh, having a folder that travels through throughout the system. It's marvelous. I mean, there are, and I speak that this, I mention that from the uh, point of view of someone who had to do that kind of work, you know, where you need to coordinate services and what have And I would add to that some comprehensive folder, booklet, or whatever that advises you, as someone in the system, of the, the different services that are available to you, um, the different kinds of housing. Uh, a big piece for me, my bias is communication. And so anything that you can do to enhance the communication between and among all the various parts uh, is, is helpful. Um, the, other, <laughs> um, the other issue that I ran into uh, was getting my initial health and mental, my initial medical and mental health issues addressed in a way that was needed. I have a disability that you can't tell by looking at it. Right? It's, it's a neurological thing that I won't bore you with, but it needs accommodation with regard to my, um, my use of space within the shelter. I had to go through a number of different terms and whatever, and it was only actually COVID that saved me because I was transferred to a hotel where I was in a room on my own. And since then, you know, the, the various pieces that uh, were needed around that, that sort of understanding, um, have been available. But I had mentioned to, to someone at that time uh, when I was trying to get accommodation, I said, you know, I'd really be willing to to give uh, some sort of orientation or because there are other people that say, I know I'm not the only one in the system who has a disability that's not visible. And some sort of acquaintance with the various kinds of things that you might run into, I believe it would be helpful. Uh, of course, that happened. There was something else. I'm so sorry. It's a point that everyone I am just supposed to know. So the other piece that's that's very important with regard to, to telehealth, I think, is that you don't have to uh, be worried about um, um, paying for transportation. And you don't have to be concerned about mobility issues. Uh, since I uh, became a, um, a client within the system, I was diagnosed with something that does limit my ability in many ways to, to, uh, to access certain kinds of housing. Um, it requires me to go to a lot of different appointments, and had I not known about accessory art, that would be a problem. But again, I don't. I think that you're going to find that as you get, at least I found that as I got older, if there's uh, a need for it, I've got it, you know, I've never looked at everything. And um, it's, it's telehealth and accessory art and communication, and I hope I'm making a little sense here. Thank you, okay. Yeah, uh, Dr. Littleton, I want to bring in 
these other models too of a safe haven, stabilization beds. Uh, when we think about low barrier models of care, why these models aren't more widespread and how do we change that? Yes, thank you for bringing that up and thank you for having me. Um, I've been doing this work for um, almost 20 years and I think that as a physician, the thing that I wanted to address was really all the social determinants of health, you know, the things that make health more difficult for people. Um, and I found that, uh, you know, our system uh, kind of intersects that. And uh, as Dr. Larocki mentioned, mentioned earlier, you know, uh, individuals who become homeless, it's, it's an end stage of what failures of all of that system. I, I think that when you have no place to stay, uh, sometimes we lose our recognitions of what's important about a home, right? And why it's important for people to have a safe place to stay. And in our shelter system, although I, I think it's wonderful, we're kind of one of the only cities that is a place that can, that has an op, you know, has made it our obligation to house or at least shelter all of our citizens. Um, sometimes we have to think about kind of how we do that and, and what's the best ways to do that, right? And I think the pandemic has brought that to very stark attention, right? Uh, when people are in congregate settings where they're amongst so close proximity to many other people, uh, in a lot of ways that's not healthy, right? And we saw that, you know, physically it's not healthy. They, they get more viruses and um, infections. Um, and, and so I think there have been many, um, unfortunate things that have happened with the pandemic, but I think we have, has also allowed us to think about other ways to do things. And as we mentioned in the first panel, uh, certainly telemedicine is a, is a venue to help better deliver care in terms of their, in their medical services. But I think it also helped us realize that that congregate setting is not as helpful for a lot of individuals and brought up more the importance of individual uh, space uh, like EJ has mentioned, is very important. Um, and I think we've now started to expand our models to have more safe havens and stabilization rooms, which are kind of a, a answer to that congregate setting where people can have their own space. And I, I work in uh, the Bronx, I work with here for the Homeless and Bronx Works uh, at a drop-in shelter called The Living Room. And in a lot of ways, that place is a, we call it kind of the shelter of last resort because a lot of those individuals have gone to the main intake shelters, they've gone to the regular shelter system, and for various reasons uh, where there are many barriers to our regular shelter system, um, there are rules and restrictions and curfews. Uh, you have to sleep with a lot of other people. It's not very safe. People steal your stuff. People will be using drugs. Uh, you know, so for, for many of those reasons, if you you don't go to your room on time, you kind of get displaced and you have to kind of start the process over. Um, like well, I mentioned, a lot of times it may be in a place that's, you know, you're moved around a lot. Um, whereas most of the individuals who end up at the living room have tried that system and it hasn't worked for them. Um, and so it, for a lot of individuals, going out and sleeping on the park bench is, is easier for them because it's in the neighborhood they want to be in. It's in the community that they know they feel more safe there than they would in a, in a congregate shelter in a, in a different borough. Um, and so safe havens have, and stabilization rooms have kind of allowed individuals to have their own space, which is so crucially important um, when you're trying to get yourself, you know, back on your feet, get all the paperwork that you lost, you know, individuals who struggle with homelessness, uh, you know, you have been in and out of many places, as James mentioned, and, and paperwork, just keeping paperwork is very difficult when you're on the street, right? Um, if you fall asleep on a subway, many patients say, like, I wake up and all my stuff is gone, you know, so really um, being able to have a place that you can keep your, uh, your possessions safe is really important. Um, so it's, it's been a blessing that the city has kind of realized that and has, you know, listened to individuals with lived experience and what best fits their needs. And so we've been able to expand our stabilization and safe haven beds. Uh, and the work that I do at the living room, uh, we have the clinic uh, co-located at the drop-in shelter, but we also do street outreach. 
uh, and we've been doing that for almost 20 years as well. And we usually try to engage with individuals who are still living on the street and try to talk to them about what things they need to come indoors. Um, and usually the biggest, the first thing is having that safe place, place to stay. Um, so when we're able to offer them that, in addition to maybe addressing some of their other needs that they may have, and many individuals who are still living on the street usually are struggling with either mental health issues or substance use issues. And our, our program does an initiation of uh, MAT, so we help them with their opiate addiction um, and can get them started on medication um, at that the same day if they are interested and kind of that combination of being able to help them with those uh, urgent needs that they may have as well as giving them a safe place to stay has really helped them um, kind of start the process of getting uh, a place to come. Yeah, so, so how do we scale up models like that and also make sure that people know about them and, and anyone respond, but I also want to bring in Dr. Schwetzman here uh, because this also implicates funding streams, right, for this kind of solution. Yeah, I think that what folks have been talking about has been right on. Like, I mean, we know that the health, what's amazing to me listening, and, it, and it's been really amazing to hear the commitment that folks have in making the systems change. And that commitment will bring magic and change. And that is really terrific, is from my perspective. And I think that there's been a tremendous sense of respect here on all of the panels as to who the folks are that we're working with that need health care and feeling the most from our societal roles of what has been mentioned, which is the racism, the consequence of our our society isms, what we what we prioritize, uh, we're greedy. Uh, you know, we, we don't have enough. Nothing's ever enough. We have to, you know, and all of these issues are consumerism, like of, of how we are trained, like the biggest, you know, some of, some of the issues of our society, of our, what our kids and grandkids are doing. You know, consumerism, if they don't have what the other kid has, nobody's happy. And it's, it's really all of that consumerism, military, like thinking about safety issues. It's not even psychological safety. It's like we all, we're, our society is saying, you know, if we have a cop on every block, then we're safe. Well, that's not safety. And, and that's the kind, and having a doctor on every block is not going to give us health. And that's not health. And how are we going to heal ourselves and allow other people to heal is really what I've been hearing on these panels. And the fact is that we just don't have some of the mechanisms to do that. That our funding situations is such that it still partializes as if we're not a part of what is bothering us. That we're still in the age of our head, body, mind, and spirit are completely separate when we know they're not. And the issue about intergenerational stress and wellness and how that impacts us, when we know that we're realizing today more and more how our mental health and our health is impacted by how society treats ourselves, the aspects of where we are in our society, our class in society, and our race in society. So I think those issues have really been prominent on these panels, and I, I think that is right along. And now the next step is, how do we integrate all of this? And is the medical health community the place to integrate this? It was interesting, something like 60% of people who go to the medical doctors who are among homeless folks, when they're going to the doctor, they're not asking for about their physical health. They're, they're asking about social determinants. Where can I get my rental assistance? Where can I get uh, all of these other kinds of issues, my food and, and other kinds of things that there are concerns about that isn't always about, if you will, our traditional health services. 
So it begs if we say we want to meet the clients where they're at, that we have a more integrated approach to what it is that we're doing. And it is a regulatory and funding problem. And, and we do have to push. You know, I, I had a boss years ago who hated pilots. <laughs> she really hated pilots. If you said to her, I'm going to do a pilot for this, you'd say, oh, no. In part because pilots sometimes don't go anywhere. You know, and it, we do a pilot, we learn a bit, we learn, oh, isn't that fantastic? And then it never gets, uh, we're never able to really put it out so that everybody's doing that pilot. Uh, so I, I say this with ambivalence, knowing, because I respected this boss a lot, uh, that maybe we do need more pilots. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, in ways of, so that we can learn. We, we know that we have to meet clients' needs uh, differently than what we're doing today. We, and many of us, and many of you, already have articulated <laughs> What, what needs to be done. But we haven't had the ability to get our funding and our regulatory processes to be waived uh, to demonstrate this. And in my experience with the state and the federal government, the only way that happens is if we say, we want a waiver to do this pilot. <laughs> and and it, it, so on one way, I hate to be incrementalist about this. Uh, and, you know, I'd love to just, you know, there was this show in the 70s, Bewitched, you twinkle your nose and everything lives. I love that we could do that, but I think everything is an incremental approach. And, and, and that's sometimes not terrible because then we don't end up doing something that's the fad and it really hurts people because we don't want to hurt people. We want to do science. We want to learn. We, want, we don't want to be in denial. Uh, but we also want to know what works. We want to be able to use more precision medicine so that people don't suffer as long as they, they do now uh, with what we know. Uh, so those are kinds of things that, from my point of view, I would say that we do need waivers um, and we do need research uh, because we still really don't know for whom what works. We have a general sense. Like we know, of course, housing works. But you know, housing doesn't work in the way we think of housing for everyone. Some people really thrive in family life. They need other people in their home. Mm -hmm. Other people, they need a room of their own. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that helps them to thrive. And that's very different. And I, I see it even, you know, with certain people where they want to live, where, what they want to do. And sometimes we've come up with solutions that are very costly, and it actually is isolating and not as helpful as someone else, who someone would want and their desire. So I think there's a big continuum on this that we have to be more open about and, and be aware about. And my other thought on that piece is that, is to learn from others, that to, to ask, actually ask the people what's their uh, fault, what uh, is their hope and desire and have it feed in so that we can learn from what their experiences and what is work for them. Yeah, so let's let's continue on that train of thought. Let's say we're building a pilot right now. You know, what what is everyone's hopes and dreams? And, and Dr. Schretzman, I know you have some ideas too about funding and using housing offsets also as a way to kind of sustain that. So maybe let's say we use that to fund this pilot that we're gonna develop right now. And what is, what is everyone's kind of ideal? Everyone, you know, jump in. Well, the first thing is our rental assistance programs and how we use that. But maybe, and this is heresy, and I don't think the mayor is against these ideas. Uh, I think the mayor is very open to different ideas. Is that we use 
reduce some of the rental assistance in ways that people can share things and that do support families. Uh, and we know that there are, not for everybody, not everybody, but some, for some families, siblings will uh, be happy to have you if you can provide and you had a counselor with you so when you are having troubles, I have somebody to call and I'm also getting a couple hundred dollars a month for my rent. And that, that could help me to be financially more stable and it, it could, uh, those, are, those are some of the kinds of housing models, if you will, for folks who have, have uh, low to moderate needs, if you will. And I think that's the other piece. We did this study on aging of the homeless. Most, and we looked at their medical needs. And most people is moderate to, to medium needs. It was a small group that had very significant needs. And those folks, yes, we, we need different models for very supportive medical interventions. Uh, and, and that, but that's a, a smaller group than the other group where we can figure out different kinds of housing continuums that include supportive housing, but also includes other kinds of continuums so that the finances, some of the regulatory processes can be alleviated so that money can go to different people. Uh, and there's more flexibility in the rental assistance and how it gets used. I'm just speaking right now. You know, like, jump in. What are you thinking? What are you talking about? These are thoughts. Absolutely. And I think they're, they're wonderful thoughts. Really, it's, it's great to, to hear them as someone who was in the system. Um, what I'd like to do now is to think about taking a step back in this trouble. But from what I gather, there hasn't been a review of the policies and procedures that are used within the various systems and organizations. Um, I don't know if that requires to it ever or certainly not most recently. And the kinds of things that we're talking about that are really great and are needed, um, it's difficult to, how do you say, solid? it's difficult to really be sure about that without first doing a needs assessment, a formal one, by someone else <laughs> okay. who can really speak to what the issues are as they see them, as staff people, uh, and certainly as, as people who are residents. Um, that would then give us the information that we need to know what kind of structure we need to put in place to make the things happen if we want to. Um, without that, we're relying upon uh, um, various innovations which may or may not be applicable. Uh, creative thinking, there are guys and some wonderful people in the system who are always working and doing, um, doing something, or at least attempting to do something to help, without ever really knowing if that's going to be the outcome once you get on the other side. Uh, so I would say that's my, uh, my thought right now. Thanks. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Uh, you know, it's interesting that you have I have been around homeless services a long time, and I'm not sure um, the system itself has ever done a formal needs assessment. They do needs assessments on individuals and assessments on yeah. families, but not as a system. So that's an interesting um, point of view. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it's really important. Yeah. 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 There's something about assistance. That, that, that one of the things that happens, of course, is that we re revisit your mission and uh, see whether or not those things that are in the mission are not only being, uh, not only being worked, worked toward, but worked toward in a way that you can have a desired outcome. So, you know, yeah. you, you, you're speaking to, you know, you're so right, because the last time they did a mission uh, was in 2005, I think. Uh, and that's, oh, that's almost 20 years, right? And we have a lot of advancements in thinking. We even have language in thinking that we didn't even have that language to articulate some of these issues that we have today, like around trauma, racism, the effects of 
multi, all of those, that kind of language was not available. Uh, and with that, they're usually or very good because they're often received in right. governments and that stuff. Yeah, that's really, uh, that's, I will certainly take that back and think that through. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think my ideal pilot would be uh, the comparative. I think that, like our society, I mean, we're a capitalist society, right? So I think a lot of people speak in money, right? And I think we look at the cost of homelessness, right? I think it is a very expensive thing to, you know, house, temporarily house individuals. You know, I have uh, one of our safe havens, which uh, we house individuals in. Um, and, you know, each individual shares a room with one other person, they have a shared kitchen and bath on that floor. And, I, you know, I think Bronxworth pays, you know, $40 a night per person uh, to house them in this building, which is not very well run, um, doesn't have adequate electric, so it's to the point where they can't have air conditioning units in their rooms because the electrical can't support it. Um, yet we're paying a thousand dollars for all the individuals a month to stay here. You know, so I feel like we should have this pilot of you know how how much does it cost us to house our individuals here in this setting versus actually making housing permanent housing affordable, right? For them to have their own place and stay, and how much would that cost? You know, I think it, it's a very adequate comparison to like universal health care, right? We always say, oh, it's so costly, it's going to cost so much. How much does it cost to have all these individuals go to the emergency room, right, and get this urgent care that if they had preventative care, they could have, we could have saved tons of money, right? And I think if we could really make that case to the policymakers who are making help, you know, who are working for us to make these decisions, we might start to, start to think about being more preventative uh, in our plans, uh, preventing people from losing their place in the first place, making their housing more affordable um, so that individuals uh, don't end up out uh, on the street. So that would be the pilot I'd love to see. I, I want to add a little bit to your answer. I want to be the pilot naysayer, but I want to add some content. <laughs> Um, I think it's easy to design a pilot that's small and that can, it's easy to help a small number of people. Um, particularly sometimes pilots are designed where they have special access to um, a direct line of communication to XYZ person who can help them get help them out for it. And so when you have that pilot program, it's easy to make sure that these 50 people that are enrolled in this program are getting the maximum benefit from this program. But when we have a scope of the need that we see here in New York City with respect to homelessness um, and health care needs that we have, we have to also make sure, and like your mind sort of went where our mind went back goes, and is that we have we have to think about the societal implication then afterwards and have the will, political will and finances behind actually expanding pilots to meet the needs of everyone in that sort of circumstance. So I think that's an, that's one of the really important things to think about as you're doing pilots is like what are what are the realistic policy implications of expanding this to meet the needs? So you need to know what the need is, right? To speak to your point of the needs assessment. Um, and so then part part of I think what might be most helpful because we live in a system, unfortunately now where profit reigns supreme both in housing and in healthcare. Um, you know, so both thinking about ways to organize around. Um, changing that, but also ways to convince health and private health insurers and health systems that it's in their financial best interest to um, implement programs that address social determinants of health. So, like providing housing, um, like providing other sorts, of, or other sorts of things that might help people with complex care needs, um, medical respite, short term options, etc. But um, I would just sort of, yeah, that's, that's my kind of caution against pilots, but thinking about more. Uh, implications for scaling up to what the actual need is. Yeah, I want to jump in and bring in Max to talk about insurance and think about how insurance fits in here in terms of creating more access, but then also conversely, what are the ways to promote access that only exist outside the insurance system and explore that tension a little bit? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the pilot conversation is interesting too because in some ways a pilot is designed to test something out and another way to test something out is to 
have a model that some people have access to and other people don't. And if it works for the people who have it, then right. that in some respects is a pilot and the need is to create a program that's available to everyone who would you know, qualify with broader eligibility. And I should just say, I'm not thinking about housing pilots or programs. Specifically, my, my focus is on um, access to health services and, and health insurance, and particularly for immigrant communities. And so I think the fact that we've had uh, close to 80,000 people arrive in the city in, in the last year, very shortly after crossing the, the border, and close to 50,000 of them currently living in city housing is the reason that I am here today because I focus on immigrant health access issues, many of which are a lot of the healthcare access issues that the last panel spoke about and that my um, co-panelists here have addressed. And then there are some um, unique compounding barriers to care uh, for immigrant communities related to and I mean, immigrant communities are not monolithic, right? But there are some real unique barriers based on immigration status that prevent people from accessing certain systems because of federal restrictions, state restrictions, and to a lesser degree, city restrictions. Um, and so we, we know that health insurance is a really important predictor of access to health services. They're not the same thing because health insurance has all kinds of problems, as any of those of us in the room who are insured know. So insurance doesn't mean access. By the same token, not having health insurance does not mean you don't have access to health services. So it's a really important distinction, and particularly in the city, uh, probably more than anywhere else in, in the US, there are really meaningful access points for people who don't have coverage, and yet the lack of coverage um, it continues to be a, a, a real barrier for people. So. There's a, there's a very complex overlay between the, the already somewhat impenetrable healthcare system and the completely impenetrable immigration system. And when you layer them on top of one another, you get this really complex patchwork that we don't need to get into in a lot of detail here. But just to note there, you know, there are a lot of people who um, we, we may perceive to not be eligible for benefits who actually are in New York City, including the majority of the people who are arriving from the border right now. Many of those people are already eligible for health insurance, but as we've talked about, there are so many barriers to accurate information um, that people don't necessarily know that. So one you know, really important thing to do through the shelter system, through healthcare providers, through community providers, through advocacy organizations, is to make sure that people are actually receiving the information, uh, accurate information about their, their access points, and that can really knock down a lot of barriers. Um, but, but then there's this remaining barrier across all sorts of public benefits. My particular focus area is on health insurance. So, you know, I would say the the state of New York is regularly piloting <laughs> expanding health insurance eligibility to people and then determining that it works really well, right? We know Medicaid works <laughs> very well when it comes to certain metrics of accessing health care compared with people who don't have access to a Medicaid-like program. The state created an, another program called the Essential Plan uh, almost 10 years ago now um, for people who make a little bit too much money for Medicaid and, and noted that that program is working really well for people who are slightly above the, the Medicaid income threshold. So the way to turn that pilot into a full-blown program for everybody is to eliminate the immigration status restrictions. And the state continually fails to do this. And they actually just failed again yesterday. <laughs> um, and now we are stuck with this situation where we have uh, uh, many, many people, for over 400,000 people in New York State who have no access to health insurance because of their immigration status. There's no way around it. There are many ways around how they can access health services because we have the biggest public health system in the country in health and hospitals, and we have a huge network of federally qualified health centers or community health centers, including through the health and hospitals network, but also through many other providers who are in the room today and many who aren't. And so I think there you know, from, from a policy perspective, there are solutions related to um, eliminating immigration status-based restrictions, and then there are solutions related to, some of which already exist and, and perhaps need to be built up more around the, uh, this question of access, independent of um, health insurance and, and providing accurate information to people doing and, and, and appropriately supporting the people, many of whom are 
or all of us who, um, who disseminate that information. So adequately f supporting the programs that do health outreach and education to make sure that people are, are um, aware of the, the services that are available to them. This is an issue that uh, very much exists you know, within the communities of people experiencing homelessness or unstable housing, and particularly if it's unstable and you need new information constantly as a result of shifting geographies, as has been talked about a lot. And then there are some compounding effects, again, based on immigration status, because in addition to actual policies, there is a centuries-long history in this country of persuading people that they likely um, can't access something, shouldn't access something, that if they do it will negatively affect their future ability to change their immigration status or their family members. And so it requires just an extra layer of, of outreach. And there are great programs that are funded by the city council and administered by the health department. There are great programs through individual community health centers and through health and hospitals and other providers to, to get this information out there. But it's just a constant um, battle that I think we need to, to continue to um, work on and, and, and create these models and then scale them and fund them appropriately across all levels of government. I want to shift also to another really vulnerable population in this is um, people who are dealing with substance use issues, which as we know is, is really prevalent. And what changes are we needing on the local, state, and federal levels to make these services more accessible to homeless New Yorkers and then also better integrated with other kinds of care. You know, the first panel talked a little bit about this, but especially with this, I really want us to think about the red tape that needs to be cut and the regulation or oversight that, that might be needed, you know, an example of, of one of these types of things. So uh, I want to start with you, Dr. Littleton. Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Dr. Rock has mentioned, unfortunately, um, overdoses is the number one cause of death in individuals who are homeless, uh, and it's uh, certainly uh, rising um, with the infiltration of fentanyl and heroin supply. Uh, many people are dying from not only struggling with their substance use, but dying from it um, at astronomical rates. Um, and stigma is a big, big issue, and, and it was listed amongst the many of Dr. Lorac's barriers to care, which there are many. Um, but that's one of uh, the biggest uh, reasons why many people have difficulty uh, getting the care that they need, especially with substance use and mental health. Um, and I think trying to uh, increase access to insurance so that people can afford, there are, are some uh, FDA approved very effective medications for opiate use disorder, um, and uh, many people don't have access to them um, and are not aware of them. Um, so being able to have insurance to, to cover them getting to a clinician to be started on medication. Um, but, but there's also a lot of uh, other aspects of addiction in terms of mental health and trauma that happens that it overlaps uh, with the the, the people receiving care. So being able to have access to mental health is also crucially important. Um, many individuals who have substance use issues have, and who are homeless um, have had trauma at many aspects of their lives. Many have had it in childhood, which has maybe led to um, part of their uh, mental illness and substance use. Uh, but then certainly once they have been struggling uh, with a life of substance use, have inevitably um, encountered uh, some trauma and negative things that have happened to them from living on the street. Um, so being at, having access to mental health care uh, is crucially important. We have you know, clinics that are co-located co at some of the shelters, uh, but not as many as we should have. Um, and I think that's crucially important, um, especially in um, shelters where we have a known high rates of substance use, um, not only access to the treatment, but also harm reduction services. 
uh, you know, many individuals are not in a place where they necessarily want to uh, stop, but they want to do it safely and not die from it. And so it's important for individuals to have access to Narcan, um, to be able to have access to unused syringes, uh, unused equipment that they use for uh, their drugs so that they don't get other health problems from their substance use in terms of HIV or hepatitis C. Um, and other infections that they may get. So um, I think those are the largest tenants. I think that it's important to have access to all sorts or sources of, of that treatment. So Suboxone or buprenorphine is a prescription medication that uh, people can get for their opioid use disorder that has to be prescribed by a doctor. We've had some policy changes now where we kind of increase providers' access to be able to prescribe it. We uh, previously used to have a waiver and have to do all this extra training for it, which really, uh, you know, decreased uh, physicians' uh, willingness to want to prescribe it. Uh, we've tried to open up access to that. But I think stigma is also uh, a barrier for providers as well, um, because uh, you know individuals who have substance use usually have a lot going on in their lives, and when you're stuck on a 15-minute visit, you can't address all of those things. Um, and so many physicians are weary to do that. Um, we also need to increase access to methadone. Um, methadone is also a very effective medication for opioid use disorder, uh, but you have to go to a methadone clinic. And that is also very stigmatizing. You have to do that's the only reason you're going there. Today. You have to wait in line. You have to go every day. Uh, there's a lot of uh, limitations to being on methadone treatment. That even though it may be a good viable option for someone to with their struggles, uh, they don't want to go through all of that. They can't go through all of that if they have all of these other appointments that they have to do to get their housing, to try to get a job. Um, so being able to have access to that, making it more readily available is an important um, goal as well. Um, there has been some regulations and some discussions about making, having local clinics for methadone um, to try to uh, reach people who may need it and it, it may make it easier for them to utilize. Um, but I think that's important as well um, and increasing people's ability and access to harm reduction tools um, is also important. So are there other regulations or things that we can break down to make that model, the mobile methadone clinics, accessible or create these co-located <coughs> clinics on shelter sites? Like, why, why don't we have that? Well, we have it a little bit, but I think we need to expand it. Um, and I think that, you know, funding and um, making sure that people who may be eligible for Medicaid uh, actually have active Medicaid, uh, you know, Earthbound spoke about some of the limitations to when you move locations and your Medicaid is inactive, uh, and that always makes it more difficult for someone who is homeless to keep their insurance uh, that is working. Um, we have some FQHC clinics, and Everybody Homeless is one of them, where we have a 340B grant to be able to provide medications for people at no cost to them. Um, so that kind of immediate access to getting started on treatment and care is critically important until people's insurance can uh, become activated. So having models like that, I think, can be extremely helpful in expanding access uh, to having clinics co-located. Uh, you know, I think telemedicine is, it can be very helpful, but a lot of my clients don't have working phones. Um, so having access to uh, that the equipment that they need to utilize that service is important. Um, so making sure that people are aware of their, um, if they can, can get their insurance active and then get uh, a, a phone through their insurance um, is also critically important. I just add one thing on the red tape and Medicaid concept. It's not specific to, to access to substance use services, but there's this um, very important interesting um, experiment of sorts going on right now across the country where people you know, people who have Medicaid uh, have to jump through a lot of hoops to be able to keep their Medicaid coverage and during the pandemic all of those rules were suspended and people just kept their coverage year over year and that process is now ending and there's a bunch of press coverage about it that calls it you know, the Medicaid unwind or other kind of strange sounding terms that really is about asking people to submit a lot of paperwork all over again, or in some cases for the first time, because maybe they got Medicaid for the first time during the pandemic and have never gone through this process before. So to the extent that we can think about 
now, but also you know, a year from now after this process has ended, like what types of flexibilities did the federal government offer states? What sorts of things did states, and in our case in particular, New York State, decide to do or not do to make that process easier for people? And if anything really rises up, then we should make those things permanent. You know, like there's, there's, there's a, a greater effort now than I think there probably has ever been in New York to try to use other information that's already available about people to make sure they don't lose Medicaid. Like, is, is someone enrolled in SNAP but we don't have all of the correct information about Medicaid? It doesn't matter if we don't have the right information. If they're enrolled in SNAP, by definition, they're eligible for Medicaid, so just keep their coverage going. So right. it's, it's a lot of, I mean, it sounds like red tape, because it is. It's like, it's like behind the scenes paperwork stuff that can mean the difference between being able to access programs that require Medicaid coverage and, and that don't. Yeah, along, the, along those lines, and um, we're getting close to Q and A. So, if you all have questions in the audience, please start thinking of those. Um, how can healthcare organizations and governmental agencies, thinking the city and the state, make sure that everyone involved in someone's care or who interacts with someone that they're all talking to one another and that they also have the patient information that they need? And are there specific ways that policymakers can help break down? Those balls too. Well, I'm not quite sure that uh, this is the, the, the target the point that you're addressing, but one of the things that um, my provider uh, at Susan Place had difficulty with was getting reports back from the uh, the special. Um, the specialist, but if there was some way that that could be put in place as a procedure or a policy or whatever that the uh, the specialist you're seeing reports back to your general practitioner, whoever that might be. Yeah, I, I think one of the aspects is really having kind of a shared EMR system, right? I think that um, our veterans association and that. I, that care for veterans, they, they have a unified system throughout the country, right? Where any, well, if you go to a VA program in New York or California, they have access to that. And when I heard about EMR, you know, and this is when I first got out of residency, I was like, oh, this is great. Well, you can read everybody's notes and it's available anywhere you go. But, you know, our capitalist system had to put a wrench in it, right? And you have to make some type of profit and everybody has to have their ability to make their better EMR. Um, and rather than kind of have that put out to everybody, and vote on the best system and all let's use it everybody got to pick their own system and some pick you know most yeah. some of that is financially based right which is the one that's going to work for us that we can afford um, and none of those EMR systems talk right and so I think if we really wanted to try to have that communication we yeah. should try to have a more unified EMR system at, at least in, in the homeless realm where we are d dealing with the same individuals who may be coming in and out of different shelters and uh, different um, organizations that are caring for them, um, having kind of a unified system that we can all visualize uh, would be really helpful. I think that we've tried that in different uh, Rios where you can you know sign in and kind of access other people's systems, but that's also fraught with some difficulty and individuals have to sign consents in all the different places so that you can see the information and that, that doesn't always happen. So I think we really should try to you know, if we could have a unified EMR, um, that would greatly help with, with shared information. Yeah, that was a consistent complaint for my provider that we didn't have one. Yes. You know, I also know that yeah. folks have been working on a digital wallet mm -hmm. so that uh, people can hold their health insurance information with themselves mm -hmm. so, and they would be able to share it to who they share, because we have to realize people have trusting relationships and they have non-trusting relationships. Mm -hmm, that's true. So they don't want to share everything. Mm -hmm. So they would have some choices. And these are like these digital wallets that uh, this is like the new thinking mm -hmm. around healthcare. So because there's so many doctors, people go from one shelter to another, or they go they they go to housing or whatever, and they lose their. Uh, what their health paperwork uh, has been and what has been going on. So this is one of these promising ideas. This is something that's being uh, looked into now. Yes, I think, yeah, I think it's yeah great. looking yeah. into it now. Okay. It, a lot of this comes out of, if you will, the information technology world, the yeah. IT world, but they are looking into digital 
uh, monitoring for health, for your health benefits. And, and what it's kind of like when you sign into a hospital, mm -hmm. you can see your record, but you would only have it, it would be your record for you. Exactly. Well, that's something that as I describe myself as being an analog baby in a digital world, that I would need some training on. <laughs> yeah. So we've got a number of audience questions. Uh, I want to start with this one about uh, Medicaid. There are a number of Medicaid managed care organizations that serve the city. Would a smaller number of plans help with all of this? And then mm. if, would it also help if we had an MCO, a managed care organization, specializing in serving members who are homeless and perhaps allow a broader group of service providers to bill Medicaid. I'm, I'm going to start with the last one because the other ones are beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the last one is would it, would it, like having a broader provider network of people, uh, of providers accepting Medicaid? Yes. I mean, m one of the largest barriers around Medicaid coverage is that there aren't enough providers who will take it. And so this is one of the things when I was saying that having health coverage is not the same thing as having access to care all the time because you still need to find a provider who accepts your coverage, which is true regardless of the type of coverage you have, but is much more complex if you have something um, like a Medicaid plan that not so many providers um, will take. And it relates in part to a conversation that the previous panel was having and also I think to the question of what policymakers can do to have providers um, coordinate care better, which is reimbursement rates are, are like the huge elephant in the room underlying a lot of this stuff that policymakers have to weigh in on because they have to put money up for it, which is that Medicaid reimbursement rates are extremely low in many cases. They vary by state, but really every state has very low Medicaid reimbursement rates, and so there it, it creates an incentive for providers to decline to participate in Medicaid Medicaid managed care networks, um, and, and then also from the care coordination perspective that providers aren't paid enough to do the type the, the really important coordination work that forms the backbone of making sure that that people and people's information doesn't fall through the cracks. And so contemplating the role of, you know, in particular primary care providers and the ways that primary care is reimbursed through Medicaid as a model for the rest of the healthcare system, I think is, is really important to look at. But ultimately, yes, more providers need to accept Medicaid. It's just not only on the providers to do that. There's, a, there's some system change that needs to happen for, for that to be possible. And the other part of this question gets to, are there too many cooks in the kitchen when we're talking about insurance? Or like, are there too many insurers with Medicaid managed care plans? Would a smaller universe help somehow? This is something the state has explored somewhat and it's gotten uh, shot down actually by the legislature of, of rebidding Medicaid managed care. Uh, not to get too wonky, but <laughs> it, would, it, would it help to have this smaller universe of, of insurance plans doing Medicaid? Maybe a pilot. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's a good idea. Okay. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm pro pilot very much. <laughs> How can we push the state to release regulations for true Medicaid respite beds that have on-site medical care? I think that, so that is like imminently happening um, from, uh, from what I understand. The state has, um, they were put out um, make, uh, regulatory, um, put out a set of regulatory recommendations for medical respite and they solicited comments on that and then they received public comments back um, on those um, proposed uh, regulations that they put out. This was a few months ago now. So, I mean, to my understanding, um, the state would, is imminently going to release some regulations around medical respite um, that should address some of the questions around how it's... Um, um, how it's implemented and what it will look like, um, as well as some, a small amount of pilot money to get some other programs up and running. Um, but I think the underlying point of that question too is that to date, medical respite 
really hasn't been exactly quite exactly medical respite. It's something more akin to social respite. So it's basically someone who it's a place where someone can go to have a bed and a meal and access to social services, as well as referrals to um, different types of healthcare and healthcare access. Um, but we didn't have the regulatory structure in place for medical services to be provided on site in those types of settings because it just didn't exist. And so um, I think that's something that, um, that the state and a lot of different advocacy groups and providers are looking to expand and um, make a thing moving forward. Um, we have a question also about safe haven beds and stabilization beds. Uh, it's proven that low barrier shelters like these, um, they guide moves to permanent housing, improve homeless New Yorkers' health and safety, as well as that of the broader community, but still often face neighborhood resistance. How can advocates best spread this message to increase availability of services? Kind of gets to our opening question too of, of increasing and scaling up these kinds of low barrier models. So how, how do advocates best spread that message and help that happen? Um, I think it would be great if the uh, people who have concerns about it actually came and did ride-alongs or came to various shelters. Um, because if you spend a moment talking with an individual who's struggling with housing, you realize they are just like you. You know, they are just in a worse off place right now. Um, I, you know, I, I think the the whole stigma of individuals being homeless who are unsafe and how you know everyone uh, you know might hurt me. Um, really kind of those walls get broken when you actually speak to someone um, and realize the life struggles that they've had to get them to the point that they're at. Um, and I think that gets you to a place where you say, I, maybe I should help this person. You know, maybe having this person in my neighborhood isn't going to, you know, lower, lower our property value. I mean, I, you know, I think it's really in speaking to people on that level um, that gets people to understand that their concerns are are, are really just um, things that really aren't reality. I've been in seven different facilities, including three isolation places. I've never had any trouble from uh, the residents there, although I have had issues with staff. Mm -hmm. So, and that includes theft. Mm -hmm. All of the thefts that uh, homeless people are connected with, not, not in my experience, mm -hmm. so. The one other thing I'll add too about you know op community opposition to different facilities, to housing, to low barrier uh, shelter options. I mean, oftentimes it becomes a bigger thing because folks that are angry about it are the loudest um, folks in the room, and so. There have been a few communities around the city that have um, you know, made a real effort to try to organize people in support of facilities um, and, um, and, and stay there for the long term, right? Not just showing up at community meetings, but also organizing groups that can then continue to volunteer at the specific site and to build relationships with both the providers and the people that are living there and to counteract that narrative um, it can be really helpful. It's hard, it's hard work, but it's something that um, is important for people to not just sort of sit back and be quiet if you don't oppose something, but to be actively um, in support of something and, and use your voice to help that. Policy could be also really helpful. Like I think every like certain geographic region should have a safe haven in it. Like it's not a it's not a question. It's just an assignment, right? And and when that happens, and when you're kind of forced to do that, you you know a lot of the objections I think would just uh, go away. How can healthcare providers best stay aware and up to date on? social and housing services that are available to people experiencing homelessness in New York City and on health services, of course, in there too. That's a great question because it, the housing services are all over the place and then, as somebody mentioned, they're not exactly centralized. So that, um, I do think that typically the shelter, most shelters have some kind of housing assistant coordinator who knows something about how to apply for shelter, how, how to apply for permanent housing. And that you Yeah, well, well that, that's a great idea. But okay, in my experience that hasn't worked as well as it should. Um, I've had 
one of the things that's problematic about the housing specialists uh, that I'm aware of is there are no appointments. You're seen on sort of a patches now, you know, it's, uh, I'm, uh, I have 15 minutes now, or uh, can I see you later? There's a lack of, uh, of organization. You know, there's a lack, and part of that, you know, quite frankly, I have to say, I think it has to do with not wanting to be held accountable. By, you know, with, um, and there's just such different levels of skills and interests. And for me, one way to approach that would be to give uh, X number of shelters the services of some sort of centralized housing specialist. Because the other piece to that is the uh, resources that one specialist has are not the resources that another one even knows about. And this particular uh, person might be able to take advantage of those resources. It's not enough, uh, as we've been talking about with everything, it's not enough for horses as we yes. There's not enough communication. Um, so I would, that I would really, really like to see something like that put in place where there's some sort of uh, uh, clearinghouse or um, whatever, where if, I can't think of how, how to put it beyond that, but some way that um, the housing specialists can um, be, uh, reach out and, and but we need something that's coordinated. <laughs> Well, I, I do think, and I'll mention to Dr. Fabian when, when I see, you know, after the meeting, that there might be a way for some kind of distribution of the housing resources to all of, all of the health providers at least begin somewhere so people are familiar with what. And I, I do think there is a process for uh, supportive housing, and there are long waits on it. So it's good to get an application, but that's going to take some time. It doesn't come right away. That would be great. <laughs> I know there is a health and housing consortium that has like kind of a group of individuals who kind of specialize in the work and have workshops and various other um, learning opportunities for individuals to learn about different uh, options. I know that Bronx Parks and Care for the Homeless also have housing specialists, and I think other uh, community-based organizations have uh, them as well, uh, where you can, and I know Bronx Parks has some community centers where you can kind of just walk in um, mm -hmm. to get advice and on, on what your housing resources are. And what, as you said, uh, business like does have specialists, uh, but again, the, uh, in, in, I, there are places that you can go where the housing specialists are not that you know, they're not, uh, they don't know what's happening. <laughs> would, would there be a way for policymakers to maybe try and standardize some of this so everyone has the same access to, to information? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, would, what would that look like? Well, I do believe that DHS has uh, a flyer, you know, information mm -hmm. as to all the housing. Oh, I do, yes. So then you can see um, who's eligible for what and what you need to do to apply. Now, in terms of how much housing is in each of those buckets is another issue. But I think the, the, they might want to again revisit that flyer because, uh, number one, a flyer in and of itself doesn't really give them enough direction. So we might be talking about a little booklet or something along the line. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think. Setting like a policymakers have a role perhaps in setting a minimum standard of the types of information that are available, but not in creating something that's so restrictive that then the organizations that actually know how this works can't create models and systems that work best for the communities that, yeah, that they're one, interacting with every day. Uh, one of the things of being closer to uh, the various housing programs and how they work would be. To increase the agency of the residents, which I find to be problematic, but you, there's very, very little, if any, uh, agency that a uh, resident has. And you really part of the team, you know, but there's no way that... You know, I, I think that's where we really have to change. I think so, too. In, in <laughs> all our avenues, in health, in shelter, is that we have to become a part of and that all of us have the solution, and it's not the expert... Person who needs to help, and, and but 
I was looking at a model down in Brazil. It was this integrated therapy model. And everybody comes together. Uh, but people learn skills. And so it helps to have this integrated model with people so that people are helping themselves, but they're also they're helping each other. Exactly. And, and that attitude and that environment is a healing environment. And I, I do believe that is the next direction of how do we create healing environments among ourselves to heal ourselves, to heal others, and what's out there so that we could encourage one another to do that support. And it is a missed opportunity, I believe, at times that we don't have healing environments in our shoulders. Well, I think that's very much the case. Um, I've been fortunate for the most part with the other one, but certainly the, the kind of place that you're in, it tends to suggest how people see you, what they think you're working out, and so on. So, um. And I think what's happened at times, and this reflects society too, is that safety becomes most important. And if we think of Maslow and the hierarchical needs, safety is a primary, we have to get safe in order to be and to grow and to heal. Mm -hmm. And so, it, but it stops there at the safety. And so sometimes our, safe, our desire for everything to be safe mm -hmm. has impeded our desire to be healing. Well, for me, one aspect of that is the way that you're saying that you, if you're homeless, uh, if you go into a hotel, let's say you're in the home by the hotel, um, no one searches you or says that you can have a can in your room and so on and so forth. What is it about not having a place to live that suddenly makes me someone uh, trusted, uh, where I cannot, uh, you know, so we, we do unfortunately have to drop it. That's, 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 that's a big issue. Exactly. It, it's really a big issue. It's, it, it's primary as to why I feel we're not able to do what we can do. Many of the, many of the restrictions are really unproductive. Um, I was just going to say, I feel like we should institute and have more funding for our peer advocates, and that there should be peer advocates in every uh, shelter uh, that's available because they really can be ambassadors of helping guide individuals of like, what's the next step? What do you need to do? Uh, because they've lived it and they understand kind of a little bit of how to get through the process. That's good. That's great. <laughs> yeah, this, this has been a great. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap up, but we've come away, I think, with some really great ideas and solutions, and maybe someone will start a pile it up. <laughs> There have been pilots where we're talking thousands of people are involved, so it doesn't yeah. have a system. So, you know, there's that be small. <laughs> All right, everyone, and thanks for our panelists. We've got the Healthcare for the Homeless, FQHCs, um, growing rapidly over the last 15 years. So there's many, many things to celebrate. 
and that's hopefully been reflected in our conversations this morning. But I do want to point out the theme that I took away in terms of what we need to do going forward, which is that we, all of us, are working within our individual silos to do the best work that we can do, and much of that work is incredibly important and very effective. But I think that the next program for our sector is to learn to work together in different ways. We need to break through these silos, first build the bridges, and then break down the walls between the silos. You have a, just take a, a, a guy walking into 30th Street who's at 30th Street for six weeks. Maybe he sees a, 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 a care from a homeless doctor. He gets assigned to a mental health shelter in the Bronx where maybe he's there for nine or ten months. He then gets assigned to permanent uh, supportive housing in Brooklyn. He's moving around the city multiple times, and every place he goes, he's at risk of having another set of labs done, another set of evaluations. And so that level of continuity of care, we have not achieved yet. We are multiple systems serving people, not a system serving people. And I think this came through so clearly in both of the panels that we need to do a better job at integration. That means providers, hospitals, and government working together more closely to create integrated care. That means interoperability of information systems like electronic health records that allow us to not force people to repeat their story again and again and again. Um, there's a huge amount of work that we can do to turn systems into a system um, and take advantage of what we have. You know, one of the reasons we're here is that the mainstream healthcare system does not work for the people we serve. Right? And so we need to create that alternative, but we need to do it together as a community. And so that's the theme that I took away, and hopefully you did as well. And we really look forward to doing that work with you going forward. So thank you for being here today. We will continue the conversation in future policy seminars. We really appreciate the time you gave us. Thank you.